Brand disclaimer, the views and opinions expressed by individuals on this platform, the callers plus invited guests are their own. The information you hear does not reflect the overall views of all parties associated with this brand. We encourage everyone to research all things heard live or via archive for edification purposes. Discretion is advised. What's going on, brothers and sisters? This is Brother Stanley Sylvain of Sin No More Ministries. I'm letting you know that every time I'm not putting together some lessons to, to bless the people out there, I am definitely listening to Sal Showtime and Debate Talk for you. God bless you all. Peace. Don't touch that dial. You're now listening to Debate Talk for you Radio. I didn't, visit, I didn't go to your website um, and look to see what your position is. I'm definitely going to take my time to look at it one day. I mean, when I, have to, when, I, when I have time. Um, but I did see your little brief, um, I guess, commercial pertaining to the topic. And it, it, it's good to know that I'm, I'm speaking to a professed Christian and um, one that claims to accept the scriptures totally as inspired. And I, and I definitely admire that because like that we have a standard to work with when we're discussing this topic. Um, so because I didn't have um, a chance to re- actually look at your position on this, I only have questions for the most part. Mm-hmm. Um, some, 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 I, may, I, may, I may have a couple of statements here and there. But I'm going to explain to you what my position is. And, and you probably heard it already and because, you know, generally – with a topic like this, if you're going to be practically like, quote, unquote, the oddball of the Christian group, most likely you heard everything. So, That's true. Good, good way to put it. Yeah, so if you, you writing books on it and, and making a website about it, you most definitely have gotten um, arrows pointing at you from many different directions, and you practically look at each probably I'm assuming that you look at every single one of those arrows and study them out to see how you can, to see how scripturally it you can still continue to hold on to your standpoint while, while, and then get ready for those arrows to come back at you again so you can have a response to say. So here's my arrow. All right. And, yeah, so and I want to see how you're going to respond to those. First of all, I like, I, I like that um, the, the, the person before me, he had, uh, he had some good questions in there because it did, it did give the impression that Satan there was an actual individual, especially in the story of Job. But I see that you find a way to get out of that one. But, you, but, but maybe it's the truth. So I, it's, just, it's, it's, it's probably it's our understanding of the truth that's, that's probably skewed. You sound so very fair, gonna, Stanley. <laughs> oh, yeah, I have to be, because, you know, here we are. We, we are in this world together. We are constantly seeking for the truth. And um, a lot of times tradition tend to um, sway our minds from, an, from a way of understanding. And a lot of times, in many cases, um, we find out later on, oh, snap, I thought I had it right all these years, and I did it. So I'm definitely going to keep a, um, an open mind to any topic that comes towards me. So I think that's the best way to come towards these things. And, well, this is my question. These are my questions for now. According to your understanding of Scripture, since I'm ignorant of it, I need you to enlighten me. Um, do you believe that there are spirit beings in our world as far as a- angelic hosts, whether they're heavenly or fallen, do you believe that God is the only spirit being in the world, or do you believe that there are others? Uh, and, and that's such a fantastic question. I've been working through that over the last 10 years of dealing with this topic of whether or not there's a Satan. I have had that question asked on numerous occasions, Stanley. And, and my answer is this. I believe there is one God. I believe yeah. if, if, we, if we find there's ev- ever any other contending spirit being, that mm-hmm. uh, are you guys getting feedback yeah, over there? Uh, hold, hold, hold on for a second, Jim. Uh, I think yeah. you probably have your speaker on too loud because I'm hearing like a feedback, uh, like a doubling. Can you lower your yeah, speaker? Maybe you're there. I tried to log into your show to get in on the chat room, but uh, yeah. it's picking up uh, on my speaker there. Let me move away from that. Sorry right, about yeah. that. Yeah. No problem. You got it uh, whenever you're ready. So, so let's try that. So, so. Mm. Yeah, still hearing it. <laughs> Yeah, that's that's frustrating for everyone. Sorry about that, listeners. 
I'm just going to shut that right off so we can continue on. So, okay. so the uh, the whole yeah. concept wow. of yeah. of this uh, of this uh, spirit being. Yeah, I'm not sure why it's feeding back, Stanley. Uh, I'm sorry, Saul. I'm I'm not even near yeah. the computer at this point. Yeah. All right. Good. I can hear you now. Good. You're good now. Okay. So the whole yeah. concept of this uh, this is alternate spirit beings in the world. If there's a Satan that can contend with God and thwart his position, then there's a second God. And the God of the Scripture says, I am God, there's none else, there's none like me. And here's where the, the, we really put things to the crucible uh, of uh, and the crux of the issue, is that if God says there's no God like me, and if he says in Isaiah 45, I make peace and I create evil, I, the Lord, do these things, and then we say there's another evil being doing those things, we're now calling God a liar in a sense, because he claims he does these things. He, sell, he tells it over and over again. So that said, I believe there's this one God that he can manifest any place, any time, as 185,000 angels, or as uh, four horsemen of the apocalypse, or as an angel to to speak to Balaam, who's riding on his ass to go curse uh, the Israelites under Balak's solicitation. And therefore, the answer would be there's only the one unique spiritual being that exists in the cosmos. And this creator, this spiritual being, Yahweh, he can appear. He can appear as any any entity he wants, any time he wants, anywhere he wants, in any number he wants. Yeah, yeah. Am I Yeah, I noticed when I uh, when I noticed when I muted your uh, audio, the echo sound was like oh, that came off. Uh, what about your speaker? You check your speakers too and see. If, uh, oh, my speakers are not on at all. I don't. I don't put my speakers on. No, I don't put my speakers on. Oh, yeah, mine so, are not yeah. on either. Yeah, do you, do you want me to hang up and call back? Would that be better? N- no, you're good. You're good. I'm going to just uh, try to work it out. Where I'm, I'm going to have to probably mute one person at a time to hear the other one clearly. Let's look like it's an audio issue. But So you go ahead and stand, and I'll, I'll bring Jim back in. All righty. Um, and, 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 and I hear what you have to say, that there's only one being that manifests itself in many different beings. I guess what's exact, um, I, I think that's what you're saying. I'm going to definitely need a dialogue with him. Is there a way you can, uh, we can try to work through this? I'm gonna, I need, I need yeah. a dialogue yeah. with him. Are, yeah, are, you, are, you on, are you on, Jim? Yeah, I'm, I'm on? unmuted now. Oh, most definitely. I, I, I need to dialogue with you on this one. And sure. I, I, thank you for expl- I, I thank you for explaining your position on this as far as you. And, and I wanted you to correct me. Do you believe that this one being that manifests himself in many different, in many different beings is like, like angelic hosts and stuff? Is that what you believe? Again, maybe that's, I think that's what you said, but I want to get it clear. Yeah, I would like to, I would like to uh, spend time clarifying at some point even further to explain that. But, yeah, that's the, the general and yeah, the general. Simple. Okay, okay. Uh, well, I mean, for the sake of time, I guess you know probably won't. The clarification probably would take away, especially mm-hmm. because your sh- this is your show that you want to express yourself a little bit more. But in the meantime, let me because um, I, I, I got a couple of questions. I want to understand that's your position first, as, as far as its basic in its basic line. Okay, so um, okay, so then then how do you explain that? Uh, I guess well, like when I read stuff like Matthew twelve. There were situations. There were situations there where people were possessed with devils, possessed with beings, and and they had information that the beings themselves, like the person themselves that were possessed, did, did they were ignorant of. And I can give you one for instance, a situation where the the, the um the there was a, a um, I guess a man that was possessed with many demons, and then he said. You know, his, they called him legion, for we are many. So it was a representative of the demon, that's what it seemed to me at least, that was speak, what, what pretty much was describing that there were many demons in this individual. And then this information said, this person said um, to him, you know, could you please cast us unto the pigs? Mm-hmm. So the funny thing about this is it left the individual that it was residing in and actually went over to animals. And the animals now are possessed. Now, that's the interesting thing. This are spirits that knew of Jesus because they already called him the Son of God. They expected him to come. Mind you, they haven't been in this land before. So this man, this individual that was possessed, didn't even know who that was personally. But yet, 
um, this, the, the people that were in him or the quote-unquote spirits that were in him, um, how do you explain for these spirits? Um, because knowing that there's only one spirit, according to your position, there's one spirit that manifests itself in many different ways. So uh, are we going to have to um, conclude that they are of God as well, and but yet that's the evil side of God? Or, or what? I'm, I'm just curious, and how do you explain that group of beings that were possessed that that possess that man. Well, again, I, there is a there is an answer to that question. Um, oh, great, um, mm-hmm. Stanley, and and it it it's laid out so explicitly again in volume three. Who's the devil? Jesus knew because the gospels they display the devil, Satan, over and over and over again, and people get so well, caught up in what all these devils, demons, Satan's were, and I call them the well what abouts. Right? If I give you an answer to one question, you're going to say, well, what about this? Well, what about this? And I guarantee you, if you go through any one of my volumes, you'll see that I deal with all of those. And this one particularly catches people. And it's, there's, you can get this chapter for free on my website. If any of you listeners would like a free copy of Who's the Devil Jesus Knew, just email me at jrbrayshaw at scog.ca. But the answer is this that I've discovered. In the first century, when Christ was traveling the land, there was a group of Roman soldiers called the 10th Roman Regiment. And they were the ones that were policing that entire area, including the cemetery area where the cemetery dwellers were. Now, cemetery dwellers were always the crazy people, the pariahs of society, right? Because there was no sanatoriums or mental institutions. If you were crazy, and sorry if uh, that word's offending some, I'm just trying to keep it tight here. If you were crazy, you you got sent away to the cemetery to live with other crazy people. And so the 10th, I'm putting some pieces together here, the 10th Roman Regiment, they marched under uh, Titus, Vespasian's grandson is who it was. And Titus had a standard, anybody who's into spiritual warfare knows what a standard is, it's a banner that a regiment marches under. The image that was on that standard that he marched under was a swine, it was the image of the boar. That's historical fact about the 10th Roman Regiment. Now, keep that in the back of your head as I explain this. Christ came, it says, about noon. He crossed over, came into that, the area of the Gadarenes. It says Gadarenes in one gospel, it says Gergesenes in another. So there's a discrepancy there for some reason. Um, and we need to address that at some point, but not on tonight's show. Uh, he came into the area of the cemetery. Now it says, the, the, it says in one gospel, one man cried out. It says in another gospel, two men cried out. Why is there a contradiction? Because the point being made is that there was probably many crazy people that said, hey, this guy's coming, and okay, here's a big, big, big part of this. There was always known in the Aramaic culture Christ lived in that Jewish exorcists roamed through the region. And what would happen sometimes, according to Aramaic scholar George Lamsa, uh, sometimes after supper, so in the early evening, a Jewish exorcist or a man of renown would take a handful of men that he had just dined with and they'd go entertain themselves in the cemeteries after the supper time. And they would basically torture these poor crazy people trying to practice their brand of Jewish exorcism with with very hurtful practices. And in this case, at noon, when this man or these men saw the Christ coming... Very likely they would have heard of him because he had such renown himself, and he was traveling with an entourage, which always made people think this could be an important person. And uh, when they saw him coming, they said, why are you coming to torment us before the time? And Christians commonly think, which I did for years, guys, I believed in Satan. I did spiritual warfare for years and years in my Pentecostal journey. Uh, I was 30 years in, in, in that variety of Christianity. And... Um, People think when, when this legion calls out, why are you here to torment us before the time? They think it's part of Satan or one of his demons saying, why are you here to torture us before Judgment Day at the end of the day, at the end of time? When in fact what's likely being stated is these, these poor crazy souls, they're saying, why are you here at lunchtime to harass us instead of after supper time like all the other Jewish men come? And so then these men come to him, and when Christ embraces them and shows them truth and love and authority and, and biblical power comes through him, what happens, when you, what happens when you give someone truth? Their mind is set free. And so now that his, their minds were set free, they said, we want to serve you. 
another characteristic of the Aramaic culture was to do something really, really emotionally dramatic. Uh, that's why in one case we find a great big book burning going on in the, in the uh, apostolic writings. But these guys, these, these people that sat at the feet of Yeshua and learned from him, of Jesus, they were now liberated mentally, and they said, we've got to do something. Can you send us into that herd of swine is the term, but the story can easily be said to be speaking about, they're talking about the Roman regimen that was oppressing the area under the banner of Titus, which was a swine. So they went and attacked, because the word, it says he sent them to enter into the swine. The word enter is an Aramaic word. It's Allah, and it means, it means to attack in Aramaic, but in Greek and English, it means to actually get inside something. But if we trust the Aramaic scholars, and that whole region was Aramaic, the word meant to attack physically. And now we find that Christ liberated some crazy men who lived in a cemetery. They went and attacked a Roman group of soldiers and drove them into the sea. You ever seen a great big military coup where one, one, um, one core, they push another core back into the sea? They drive them into the sea. It simply means they beat them. They defeated them. Yeah, go ahead, Stanley. I had to put you on <laughs> on mute to get that uh, effect out of the way. Put you back on. Thanks, Dan. Um, the, are you, uh, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah I, I can. can. Yeah. Okay. Um, just to let you know, um, Sal, you you bouncing like that as well. Oh, okay. and your voice is doing that as well. So yeah, I've had that happen not... before when I've had three or four people online. Yeah. Oh, okay. All right. Let's try to work through it. All right. Okay. All right. Okay. So um. Um, and um, another question I have is, um, um, I guess I, I, I'm, I'm hearing everything that you're saying about the different um, the wording of things and terminology. But what's bothering me actually with all of this is this: there were there are things in scripture that are historically historically understood, mm-hmm. and and um, and I believe that yes, context is very important when you study the scripture. But you know what else is very important in studying the scripture? Is when it comes to um, the majority of text. Um, the weight of evidence. If it points to a particular direction, if the weight is leaning on one side, um, the scriptures clearly say that a mouth of two or three witnesses let every truth be established. So, if we have all the gospels that's telling you this is what happened. This is what happened. This is what happened. In this case, it was three Gospels, because John didn't speak about it. But, but we have three different individuals that said, is this what happened? This is what happened? This is what happened? Yes, one of them said two, while two of them said one. But I don't see that as a contradiction, like you had claimed. But one of them um, said Gerg- one of them said Gergesenes, one of them said Gadarenes, right? They put them in different regions. Okay, but even even with that, the point the point is the point I'm look, I'm getting is that the whole there's, a, there's still the same focus that's going on here that there was either one or two guys that were possessed with a demon called Legion. So this is the, I'm, I'm getting that they talk about the same situation. Okay, mm-hmm. as far as the wording of the land. Um, that that's probably that part, part part right there wasn't the I think the focal of the inspiration. The focal of the inspiration that I get was that they all witnessed something and they are recording what they saw. You know, mm-hmm. um, it's a possibility that I think there was even a situation where um, I think it was Peter. He was he, he quoted a scripture in the Old Testament and but he quoted the wrong prophet. But it's still inspired. You know what I mean? A lot of a lot of the scriptures that we have are. Thought inspired and word inspired. Thought inspired meaning that the, the, the information was given by picture, and they have to put down in their own words what they see. And and things like that, you may find little things here that's a little off than somebody else's. That sort of same thing. So I'm not I'm not getting I'm not going to um, focus too much on that, but rather that they did see the story. You know, if somebody saw if somebody said they saw um, described to me five to five different ways that they saw an elephant, I believe they all saw an elephant. So that's sure. how I look at it. So, yeah. um, so I believe that there was a person there because all of them said there was someone or some um, some of them that were possessed, and um, they showed you the power of the possession going from one entity to another, and that other, all of them had said, were swine. 
All three of them said it was swine. And that's interesting because if one of them at least said it was a group of guys that we call swine, then we have something to talk about here. But if all of them said they were swine, I'm going to have to accept that because, remember, um, God writes the word that we may have understanding. Sure. Now, and I, I, go ahead. Go ahead. Can, if you I could address a couple of those points, do you mind, Stanley? I, I, under, I totally see where, you, where you're coming from and, and uh, that the fact nothing says a group of men um, it is kind of a leap for some to say, okay, how can it be a royal, a Roman regiment marching under the banner of a swine? And it may very well be the Gospels, uh, as you know, some claim the other two Gospels are built off Mark. I'm not going to go there, but let's just talk about the swine for a second. Is, 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 uh, first of all, did Jesus sin? Was Jesus ever a sinner? No. I agree. I totally agree he wasn't a sinner. But... It tells us after the incident that these these men were sitting in their right mind in front of him when all the mm-hmm. city all the city came out to try to get him to leave the region. And okay. and if one of the rules like because Christ was never a sinner, uh, mm-hmm. he he would have been responsible for destroying other people's property and therefore a sinner. Because he mm-hmm. it was his it was his issue, it was his choice, his responsibility, his action that sent those swine to their death, if they're actually swine. Now, if that's the case, he in fact is a sinner, because he broke a civil and a biblical law. You're not allowed to just arbitrarily destroy someone else's property re- because you think it's evil. Can I respond to that point? Yeah, please do. Uh, yes, um, that point that you, um, you claim that if that was the case, then Jesus would be a sinner. I, I, I kind of respectfully disagree with that. And because for the mere point that um, there were times that um, Jesus flipped tables around and did certain things to properties. And, yeah, that, um, not, and that, uh, that would not have been a sin, though, based on um, the Torah that he followed to remain sinless, right? He, he, he remained sinless according to the scriptures, and that destruction, killing people's property, is a sin comp- uh, in biblical but, law and civil law. But you're, presume, you're presuming that, that he led the, the pigs to the, to the waters. Could it be possible that the pigs chose to go to the waters? Well, that, sure, that's possible. Um, so then, that, so, so, then, so that, that eliminates that eliminates the, 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 at least the possibility that that here's a situation that we can say that the pigs go into the water and Jesus still didn't sin. Well, let's talk about them going to the water for a second. Now that you brought that up, okay. how, mm-hmm. how far can the human eye see? How Could far see? can the human eye see? Yeah. yeah. And the answer why, is, uh, why? it's about half a mile, I believe, is the answer. Now, okay. geography, if, if the Gospels are telling an actual story about pigs running, running to the sea over a cliff, the, mm-hmm. nearest, the nearest sea was either six miles or 30 miles away from that particular region. How could anyone have seen, and how could any pigs have run that far? And, and then where did they would mention... I'm sorry, you said they were mentioned. There were two there was two that was mentioned, right? Yeah. What, what, and you're saying both the names that were mentioned that were, were that far? The, yeah, the Gergesenes and the Gadarenes. They were both, the closest one would have been six miles to the sea. Okay, because the reason why I'm asking this is because they just came from a boat. The, the, um, the apostles and Christ just came from a ship. And, um, and they, they encountered this when they got off the ship now. Is it possible also that, let's say that you're correct, that it was that far, and then the human eyes cannot see that situation, could it be possible, and this is what I'm asking, that they followed the pigs? That the, the disciples... Where they were, were leading. Not well, the disciples. If, if, not the disciples. Uh, not all the disciples. It could, have, it could have been any of the witnesses. It could have been any of the people. Where are pigs are going? Where, where are we seeing no. going? Let's follow nobody, them. Oh, they got themselves killed in the water. Oh. Nobody, nobody can follow a herd of herd of um, stampeding swine um, that are racing at breakneck speed. It's it's impossible. Uh, you can't. Well, you can't. Could do you it. agree that? Do you believe that every, they were like the, like the, um, the the water area was completely void of people? I would suggest it would be. Oh, so that, I mean, based on what evidence? Based on them going over a cliff. The cliff wasn't an active area for people in that period to hang around the water and do activities. Uh, it was a shoreline okay. that was active. But do, you, but do you agree that it is a phenomenon? I mean, it would be a phenomenon to me 
that six to me six miles is not too far. That's the one. That's the one. Six miles not are not far. far. It's not far. Not too not too far to see or not too far to run. It's not too far to um to run. Now I may not not the the, the pigs. If, if you said that, um you said a half a mile, you can see right. You can see clearly a half a mile, right? Yeah, and don't quote me on let's that. Say, I'm, 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 I'm okay, recollecting. Let's just, let's, just mm-hmm. let, let's go according to your recollection as if, it is a, as, as if it is a possibility. Let's say a person can see a half a mile. I believe a person could see a lot more than that because in football fields, you can see the end of the field, and it's a, it's a, a lot more than half a mile. But anyway, oh, no, it's not. No, no, no. Uh, 150 what? yards is not more than half a mile. No, no, no. I'm, not saying, that, I'm saying the field itself. You can see the field itself. Absolutely. I mean, even, be, even beyond the field, um, I believe that the field, like, think about the entire bowl itself. It, it goes more than a mile. You agree? You're talking about a football field? Not the actual field with the numbers on it. I'm talking about the entire stadium. No, if they I, don't go more than a mile. It doesn't? No, no, football stadiums don't encompass a mile, not a square mile, not a, la- uh, not a linear what mile. A a, what about a half a mile? They may be about a quarter of a mile. A quarter of a mile? Yeah. Okay. I, okay. Let's just go with that. So then two stadiums. And That's a half a mile? Sure. Okay. So yeah, I, Hold on. Hold on, Stanley. We wanted down to the last five minutes. <laughs> it's coming down to the last five minutes of the show, guys. So, well, where did the uh, demons... Where did the okay. demons go, Stanley? After after the swine died in the ocean, in the sea, where did the demons go? Say did again? they die with the did, where? Where did the demons go after the swine died in the sea? Did they die with the swine? Is that how to kill a demon? No, no. I believe the demon went back to what they call the deep, which is the abyss of Busos, according to the Greek language, which is called the bottomless pit. Um, and I believe there's a lot of studies dealing with the bottomless pit. If you, um, so. Um, but we can get into this another time, I guess. I don't know. Uh, but um, I'll, I'll see your, your, your position. But I really believe that my last comment I want to make before before you go is that, um, and I and I see that you're sincere and you're really looking for information in that. But really, take into consideration that it's a possibility you got you have this wrong as well, because because um, that not only um, you are claiming this, there but there are many, um, and I'm not even focusing on the atheists. There are many. Um, Believers of God, claimingly, like this guy that claims to be Jesus Christ, he's a Spanish guy. Um, Absolutely. He, and he claims that Satan, there's no Satan in hell. So, so um, I, I just, just be very careful with this doctrine because it's a possibility that it could be led by him as well. So, and it, and it could go towards his advantage believing this as well. So, but maybe it's true. But be careful. Watch vigilant. He's a water line. He's very deceitful. So well, if Stanley, he can make you believe that he doesn't exist, he can do it. But anyway, go Stanley, ahead. I I I, I got to ask the listeners to go read my chapter on the roaring lion in in volume four. This is it. Satan is finished. Because you know the warning. Your warning is is actually um, not well taken. Because I I spent thirty years, Stanley, battling in the spirit in a Pentecostal church. I'm, I've used, I have access to the Holy Spirit the same as any believer in Christ. And I should equally then warn you and other listeners, if you believe in Satan, you're believing in two gods. Because a Satan that can, the Satan that can do things that God can do is defined as a god, biblically. And God says, don't have any other gods. Even though we think no. that he's, he's less than the, the one God, the sovereign God, even though we know the sovereign God is almighty, it's still a belief in a second lesser God. And that would be my concern for people who continue to believe in a Satan. But Jesus... I gotta, I, yeah, Jim, i got to ask. I mean, this is a very interesting conversation. i got to ask, are you willing to come back to the show and have more of a dialogue, uh, you know, a different setting with Brother Stanley so we can have more clarity on this particular topic, because I think people are definitely interested, and you guys are bringing up different points, uh, key points that people need to hear. Um, you know, are you willing? Yeah, if to you're like willing, if you're willing, and Stan- sure, if you're willing and Stanley's willing, whatever you just set it up, so. Okay. What okay. You, you can set are you it up. To, yeah, uh, I'm, I'm willing. I'm willing. Okay. Go ahead and set it up. All right. Not yeah. a problem, because you know we're running out of time, and it's you know we're getting very, very interesting, and you know a lot of people are getting a lot of information out of this one. Uh, before we leave, once again, let the people know uh, where they can find your websites and uh, you know the, the different books that you got out there. Let them know. 
Sure. Well, they can go to imaginenosatan.com, and there's tons of free reading there, and they can look at all my four books and email me at jrbrayshaw at scog.ca if, if anybody would like one of the one of the books for free as an e-book. Happy to do that. And uh, you can get my books on amazon.com, and, and uh, my books um, are available throughout the world. I have uh, um, African and Filipino ministers that are helping to dismantle this idea. It's not a new idea, gentlemen. This, in fact, has been going on for, for uh, almost 2,000 years as well that uh, is there this Satan entity uh, or is there only God? And so I'm, I'm, I'm not jumping in um, without um, some affirmations from pretty brilliant men long before me. Thanks, Sal. And uh, Sylvain, good to, good to see you again. Um, good to hear you, and I'm looking forward to just uh, joining in some learning together. Well, <clears throat> as far as an opening statement goes, I, 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 I want to just share with the audience a bit gentlemen, how I got to this position that I believe, and I'm going to just state it clearly, I believe the Bible teaches there's only one God, which means there's no Satan. And all of that came to be through the questions I had about what is a God. When all through Scripture we're taught, you shall have no other gods before me. There's none like me. I am God. There is no else. I am the only God. Yahweh, Jehovah, God, the God of Scripture states and and so as I explored that question, I was also considering the question of where does evil come from? And all through scripture, I've been taught since I was young, because I grew up in, in a very charismatic variety of, of uh, Christianity, and uh, in fact, um, ended up walking away from that for certain reasons when I realized things that's, that were taught in my church weren't what scripture was teaching and and that one of them was where does evil come from evil being spoken of by most in christendom to be coming from some supernatural cosmic entity that actually attempts to to um distort or or twist or deceive humans but i found that repeatedly throughout the bible we're told that evil comes from the human heart and in fact even jeremiah 17 9 says such a thing as the as uh, the heart is wicked and deceitful above all else. And all my life I've been taught that this Satan of the Bible is the most evil thing above everything, but yet Jeremiah 17.9 tells me the heart is, is the most wicked thing above and deceitful above all else. So who or what is the most evil thing? Where does evil come from? These are questions I had that I, that I wanted to explore further. I, I had believed for years and years and years growing up in, in Christianity that, that my view of Satan was the correct view was the view that the Bible taught. And, and as I continued to dig further, I looked at many sides of Scripture from the, 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 the cultural context, the literary context, the historical and, and religious and social context. And, and we, quite frankly, I found we're looking at this Satan thing from a more of a 20th century perspective than we were from a, a first century perspective or a pre-first century perspective. And then... Uh, I also had the question, how can God let a supernatural being that he supposedly created constantly harass, attack, and harm, and eventually drag a soul to hell just for not admitting that Jesus is Lord? How can, it do it? How can, how can this particular creature continue to oppose people, uh, particularly if the Messiah's death and resurrection, which the Gospels talks about, put an end, as it says, to the works of the devil? And that, that I learned, was a past tense scripture, and, and if... if Christ's death and resurrection put an end to the works of the devil, then why is the devil still working if the devil uh, is real? And in another place, I had the question come where if evil angels have been chained in everlasting darkness, how can demons still have an effect on humanity? And who's letting the demons out if they have been chained in everlasting darkness? Because the Gospels taught me that. We were also, we were, I, my, a huge question that brought me to this conclusion is, is that I've been told Satan is a murderer and liar from the beginning, for most of my life, even as a little boy in Sunday school, yet Christendom's doctrine teaches that Satan was perfect from the beginning, according to the version of Ezekiel 28 that we find in the scriptures. And and, and I, I realize that because of the, the spirit of God's work in a person's life, these questions are answerable. If I can understand the meaning, if we can understand the meaning of the words that are used in the Bible, words like the Hebrew word Satan, words like demoni and diablos and the way and find out the way the authors understood them when they spoke the words that we call the bible instead of the way we understand them today 
Because the first use of Satan we find in Numbers 22, where, where Balaam's going to curse Israel under the petition of Balak, the king, and we find that an angel of the Lord comes to be Satan to Balaam, is what we're taught. And that angel, it says, goes to withstand Balaam, be Satan to Balaam. And that's really the first place we find the word Satan. And, and using the rule of first mention, which is a common biblical study rule, I, I said maybe this word doesn't mean exactly to the writer what it means to you and me today. And so I continued to explore, and I found out in Genesis 6, evil inclination is, is mentioned, and it's referencing my human heart. Man's human heart is the evil, is where evil is. That's why it says, Yahweh, God destroyed the earth because every inclination of man's heart was evil. And then in Genesis 8, after the flood, when they come out of the ark, we're told again, man's heart is continually evil from his youth, is what we're told. There's no blaming some supernatural entity that's, that's causing evil. And, and then we find David, he uses the word in a way that you and I aren't familiar, oh, many of us aren't familiar with the use of it. He speaks of men being the Satan to him. And Job encounters the Satan in his story in the story of Job and and that particular Satan again I found to be men who were jealous of Job based on the understanding that the word Satan was never a name never a proper noun in biblical literature according to the original writer's intention of the word and one of the big ones that really struck me was when God is called Satan and this one often hits the off switch for folks and I really hope your listeners don't get their off switch hit by what I share tonight. But we find a story of in 2 Samuel 24 where David's asked, he's actually compelled to, to count the tribes of Israel. And it tells us right there, God caused David to count the tribes of Israel. So it's quite clear God's doing it. But then in First Chronicles, the writer of Chronicles, he retells that same story. And he actually says, then Satan caused David to count the tribes of Israel. So who was it? Was it God or was it Satan, I asked. This is a very huge contradiction in my view. And what I learned was because the word Satan to the writer never meant a personal, cosmic, supernatural being who has the power to behave like God in many ways. It meant an adversary. And in every case, we can find it's either a human adversary or it's the creator, God, being an adversary to man. And I went on and on through my research to to really peel back more and more of these layers that that were in place. I found I found in Zechariah when Zechariah when there we see the vision of uh, of of Joshua and the temple that those that come against this soon to be priest in this vision they they are actually men who are trying to prevent him from becoming this priest that that is being appointed by God. They actually accuse him of being dirty, in, in, according to the vision. And that's why we see this person has dirty garments that are cleansed by, by God. Because the accuser of the brethren, which is a common one, we find looking at the context of those uses in the New Testament. Because we can look at the Old Testament to find our foundation for how we understand the New Testament, I learned. And looking at the accuser of the brethren in the New Testament, we find that that is human men accusing other men of not honoring God when they in fact are, telling them their religion is not the religion of God. And the reason why is because the men who are the accusers, they're the ones who, who made Hold on, I had a little technical difficulty there, but uh, actually the seven minutes is up. Uh, the number is 877-280-9681. That's 877-280-9681. Okay, Jim Bray Show, you know, seven minutes is up. We're going to get into the one-on-one discussion in a few minutes. we got to let Stanley in and give him his seven minutes for his opening statement. And uh, are you ready, Stanley? Are you ready? All right. Let me just set this timer, and you can go ahead. All right. Um, i definitely definitely um, thankful that I'm coming on tonight to have this discussion. I just want to take the time to say thank you for this discussion of whether or not Satan exists according to the Bible. I believe that the scriptures clearly teach that Satan exists. And we can say that angelic hosts are good evidence of this. Alrighty. Um I remember um in my last discussion 
that I had with Jim, we were discussing the idea of, um, uh, I asked him on his understanding of the existence of angels. And from what I remember, I believe he told me that God can appear and manifest himself as angelic hosts. Um, so pretty much the angels are really God, you know, manifesting himself, you know, in many different ways. So pretty much that's all the angels are. It's just a part is, is of who God is. It's just a different um, way that God appears to people. It's just so, but, you know, it, it's, you know, when you, when, when one hears that, ew, it sounds interesting, but. I, I, you know, there's some issues that I have with that point because um, we find many cases in Scripture where angels refuse to be worshipped. Um, well, a couple of cases, really. But, if, but it doesn't matter even if we find one. The point is that if the angel is God or who God is or part of God, then to worship the angel would not be nothing wrong. You could find in Revelation chapter 19, verse 10, um, Peter was having a discussion with an angel. He, and then um, he, the scripture says that, and I fell at his feet to worship him. And he said unto me, see thou do it not. This is the angel responding to him. He said, I am thy fellow servant, and of thy brethren have the testimony of Jesus. And he says, worship God. For the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Now, here you have an angel here that's saying don't worship him but worship God, which shows a distinction between the two, that this angel is saying pretty much, I am not God. He's pretty much saying that, okay? And, um, and, then, and then a situation like that happened a couple of chapters later in chapter, Revelation chapter 22, verse 8. And he says, and I, John, saw these things and heard them, and when I heard and seen, I fell down to worship before the feet of the angel, which showed me these things. And then he responded the same way again, which shows again the distinction between the two. You can also um, look at Luke chapter 1, verse 19. And this is talking about Gabriel when he met up with Zechariah, dealing with the prophecy about his son, John, which is called John the Baptist, that's supposed to be leading and showing the way to Jesus. So the, and the angel answering said unto him, I am Gabriel that stand in the presence of God and am set to speak unto thee and show thee these glad tidings. So this angel is Gabriel, who's named Gabriel, is saying that he stands in the presence of God. Not that he is God, but rather stand in the presence of God, showing you that it is, these are two distinct individuals here. You know, Gabriel would not receive worship, just like the, just like the angel that we read in um, chapter 19 and chapter 22, all right? And another statement that was made in the last discussion also, and um, um, it was going towards the ending of the discussion, um, is, is because of the idea that he said, if you believe, I quote, if you believe Satan, if you believe in Satan, then you believe in two gods because a Satan that can do things that God can do is defined as a God biblically. These are his words. Um, Satan is made a God, in other words, because we say that he, he, doesn't, he does miraculous works that God is able to do. But I respectfully disagree with that point of view. Just because, first of all, that's that one, number one I wanted to make. He said, um, if you believe um, in Satan, then you believe in two gods. I want to focus on that part. Just because you believe that something exists doesn't mean you believe in them. You can believe in the existence of a person that lies repeatedly. And if they tell you something, you may not believe in them. But it doesn't mean that you, don't be- that you do not believe in the existence of them. Um, that has to be made clear. Um, Second Corinthians, you can read um, in chapter 4, verse 34, how... Paul pretty much saying that um, that Satan is the god of this world. All right, so this is something to really take into consideration, because 
it doesn't necessarily mean that Paul believed in that God of this world, but rather he considered him to be the God of this world. You know, you read in John twelve thirty one, Jesus was saying, he said, now the, is the judgment of this world. Now shall the prince of this world be cast out. And this is referring to Satan. Okay? Um, you could also read, and um, you can show that, you can see that Satan definitely was clearly distinct. He was not a concept. He was considered to be an individual. Um, you read Revelation chapter 12, verse 9. It says, and the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent, called the devil and Satan. So you see an individual that was called the old serpent, he is called the devil, and he's called Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He. Now here's a personal pronoun being placed upon this individual that is called, that is the old serpent, that is called the devil and Satan. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him, showing ownership, and he had subjects. You know, um, and in Luke 10, um, it says, um, um, for verse 17, it says, And the 70, two of the disciples, returned again with joy, saying, Lord, even the devils are subject unto us through thy name. And he, meaning Jesus, said unto them, I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. You know, you read, you put all these things together, you can see that the Bible is repeatedly is giving you the idea you know, that Satan is an individual. He is an individual. And for us to to have to create that to be a concept, we have to twist a lot of the scriptures to come to that conclusion. You know, if it was mentioned once or twice, you'd probably be correct in a couple of places. But if you have to see yourself correcting a lot of the Bible, part of the Bible and the understanding of the Bible in many places, and the Bible is supposed to be understood in its clarity, and in, and if we have to like really get into the depth of all the meanings of Satan and Satan and the devil, in many 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 cases, then I would have to stop there and say, man, if I have to change that much of the Bible for us to see that Satan is not who he is, then maybe the problem is not the Bible or many of the understanding of the Bible. Maybe it can be me. Okay, seven minutes is up. The number is 877-280-9681. Once again, the number is 877-280-9681. We're about to go into the one-on-one discussion uh, part of this uh, show. We actually changed the format somewhat to this particular show, making more of a roundtable discussion. I'm going to bring back uh, Jim Brayshaw and uh, Stanley into the room. Uh, once again, this is the time where you can uh, listen for a little bit, but uh, you can ask your questions. You know, call in at 877-280-9681, press number one, and we'll add you into the conversation. Also, the chat room is open. If you have any questions, you can type them in, and I'll read them out to the special guests. Okay, we're going to start off. Uh, Jim Brasher, you can start with the discussion. Sure, yeah, that was uh, excellent, Stanley, to, to to go through all those passages and I completely agree that it is the common view, exactly as you've expressed it. Mm-hmm. Um, I also would like to suggest, though, it's not possible for me to answer every one of those. And, and this is often the issue yeah. here with the Satan discussion, right, is that we have, there's so many, and I don't disagree, there's so many examples of what we see as Satan. But I do want to jump to a couple of them, and, and let me just address your, your reference to how I spoke of angels in our last discussion. You encapsulated it well, um, but what I, I don't know if I, I don't actually recall if I also said angels are either the presence of God if it's a, if it appears to be a supernatural thing in some force, but we find that word malach which comes from the Hebrew for angel, yes. and then the word agelos which comes from the Greek for angel, they are in almost every case referring to a human being um, that is a, a messenger because the word just means messenger, right? And because when when the Greco-Roman view of a, a mystic idea that there's other spirit beings entered Christianity, the the English word angels in the mind of the English reader became that supernatural messenger, uh, and that's why when you read the, that Luke one nineteen that Gabriel says, "I stand in the presence of God," we think, "Oh, Gabriel's that special angel, that archangel that is up there in heaven." But in fact, if we look at the cultural period, who was called Gabriel? 
in that culture that 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 um, Zechariah was standing in the temple. It just so happened the second highest priest of the temple, a human man. One of the terms for that guy was Gabriel. One of the terms for the first priest was Michael. So it very likely could be that Gabriel, when he says, I stand in the presence, that he, in fact, was this priest who says, I stand in the holy place, because that's what one of the priest's jobs was, which is very close to the presence of the Lord. And and when we jump to, uh, we jump to the issue of not worshiping them, it totally makes sense that they said, don't worship me. In fact, Revelation... Um, uh, Revelation one, I think you quoted. Uh, we talked. You talked about uh, this. This John. No, it wasn't Revel- one. It wasn't one. Okay. It was chapter nineteen, ten, and um, Revelation twenty two, eight, and nine. Uh, sure, and and where John Revelation nineteen, ten, and Revelation twenty two, eight, and nine. So when yeah. we're told here, we're, we're told that uh, don't worship me uh, because mm-hmm. I am a servant um, of your brethren, is what he says. Revelation 19.10, mm-hmm. I am of thy brethren, which is a, a clear statement. This particular priest person who's the messenger, the angel is the term, he's clearly saying, no, I'm just a human like you. I'm of your brethren. When would an angel that's supernatural in nature say, I am of the of your brethren? Oh, I can I can respond to that. Um, um, I don't know if you remember the scripture um, where the Sadducees was having a discussion with Jesus and they were trying to trap him. Um, yeah. In that discussion, um, um, in the tra- in the tra- in the discussion, it was dealing with um, re- the, the subject of resurrection. The Sadducees didn't believe his resurrection is true, so to trap him, he they, he used well if a guy marry um, if a woman married this man and he died and married his her 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 um, his brother and then so on so on so on and there were seven of them in the resurrection. Who will she be married to? And then. Jesus pretty much said it, it, that you do err in the scriptures because in the resurrection, um, they will not be marriage or those given in marriage, but will be equal to the angels. So this in is heaven. interesting. Yes, but this is interesting because here, here, we're saying that they'll be equal to the angels. Like no one that's going to be resurrected will um, will be marrying or given in marriage, but rather be equal to the angels. So now yes. I'm seeing a group of angels here. That is different from the from the people, but yet there's going to be a form of equality between angels and men. So, in a sense, I can see the angelic cults being considered brethren to humans, I, I, because they are they all they all once you'll find also in in Revelation, I'm sorry, in Genesis chapter six that they're called sons of God. You also find in in John chapter one, um, um, verses um, twelve, where Jesus said that those who believe in him are able to become sons of God. So if we are all sons of God, then we are brethren. So I, I can still see that an angel, an angelic spirit, still saying that he is the brethren of a fellow believer in God. Can I respond to that, uh, Stanley? Oh, please, please. I just want to show that point first. Yeah. that. Hello, you're breaking up. Yeah, you're breaking um, up. Uh, yeah, you're actually coming and broken up. Uh, try it again. Let me see. Uh, yeah, Jim. Am I good now, guys? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Sounds yeah. good. Okay, we can see how the angels and the angels um, can be taken to be supernatural when you reference mm-hmm. that. But with, with the marriage taking place after, now it's quite simple when we have our foundation as the the Tanakh, the Torah, the Old Testament, because what we understand is that a priest wasn't allowed to marry a divorced woman. Not in the present age that the temple was operating, nor then in the future. And if we continue to follow through the Old Testament, we find that the temple is going to be restored and rebuilt. It's called the third temple in some people's view. And there's going to be a priest in the system with if we read Ezekiel 43 to 47. So, quite frankly, when he tells them, as the, angels, as the angels in the resurrection, the priests in the resurrection aren't going to be married, and you're going to be like that because you've already been married, and now that you're widowed or divorced, you no longer will uh, marry, just like the priests won't marry in that age. So it can, be, it can easily be shown to be human priests, still even in that case. Okay, okay. Uh, that sounds pretty fair enough. But you can let's go back to the Gabriel um, situation as well. Um, sure. If, we, if we're focusing on the, the the study of the priests, 
of um, we know Zechariah, it was his roundabout to be the high priest of that Passover time period. You agree with that? Yes. Okay, so let's 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 get the idea that the Gabriel was a human was a human individual that happened to be a messenger of God. Um, the, according to the according to what from my study of the Levitical priesthood, only one individual is supposed to be in the most holy place. Only one individual. How that we have two individuals in that place. That's an excellent question. Um, as we're looking at that verse in Luke, you said that was 119, right? Yes. Zechariah said unto the angel... Yeah, sorry about that. I just wanted to plug in. The number is 877-280-9681. you have any questions, you can call in now. Press the number one. Uh, go ahead, Jim Rachel. Yeah, so um, we perceive that Zacharias is in the Holy of Holies. Is that where you're, you're standing on this yes. presently? Yes. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Yes. Well, it was it was well known throughout uh, Talmudic literature that the Shekinah of God was not in that temple. Okay. And now, Stanley, you're familiar with the Shekinah. You've studied the Levitical priesthood. Yes. Maybe Sal, you are as well. It's supposed to be the, the glory of God, and it was it would happen to be missing from that temple in that first century period. Um, for whatever, well, there was no Ark of the Covenant in there for one, but the the priesthood continued to function as if it was in many ways. So yeah. it's very it's very possible that Gabriel, the Sagan or second priest, who had a very strong role in consulting any priest who was um, the chief or high priest of the day, his role was to assist and consult with that person, and it's possible then that he would have entered. Um, in either close to or inside that very holy, uh, holy of holies, and not died because it was the it was the glory of Yah, glory of Yahweh, the glory of God that was supposed to actually kill the person who was had sin and entered in, and in this yeah. case that glory wasn't there. But um, but even with that part, it's still there's still some holes in that because if you continue reading from that, it shows you that um, that's not the case. Um, well, I don't know if you're there. Do you have your Bible open? We can actually yeah, look I at do it so. together. Okay, what version sure. are you reading from, by the way? Uh, it's the King James Version. Oh, beautiful. That's what I, that's what I read as well. Okay. Um, well, verse 19, let's continue. Let's talk from there. It says, And the angel answering said unto him, I am Gabriel that stand in the presence of God, and am sent to speak unto thee and to show thee these glad tidings. And behold, thou shalt be dumb and not be a- and not able to speak until the day that these things shall be performed, because thou believest not my words, which shall be fulfilled in their season. And the people waited for Zacharias. So really, keep this in mind. They're waiting for an individual to come out. Listen to this. And a marvel that he tarried so long in the temple. Why was he doing it there so long? Because there was a dialogue happening here. Verse 22 says, And when he came out, he could not speak unto them. And they perceived that he had seen a vision in the temple. For he beckoned unto them, and he remained speechless. Now this is interesting, because keep this in mind, if there's two individuals walking in, in the priest, which would never have been done, been done before, it's always one that goes into the most holy or the holy of the holy. Generally, more than one priest usually go into the holy place. You know what I mean? But not the holy of holies. The holy of holies is always a high priest that went out. In True. There. But in this case here, let's let's consider in considering your understanding of it. There's two individuals in there having a dialogue, but the people outside expected one to come out, and they wasn't even worried about it. But when he finally came out. Something happened. He couldn't speak. Yeah, they perceived. So they perceived. Yeah, they perceived. Yeah, so, I mean, doesn't that kind of, isn't that still kind of a strong evidence that this had to have been an angelic being that was there? You know, it, it would if, in fact, this were in the Holy of Holies. But if we look at Luke one eleven, it tells us exactly mm-hmm. where this took place. Okay. It says, And there appeared unto him an angel of the Lord standing on the right side of the altar of incense. Is it not the case that the altar of incense was in the holy place? The altar of incense was that altar right before you go into the Holy of Holies. Yes, it wasn't it the is. Holy of 
right? It is. So if that's yes. the case, then you, you could have several priests in the holy place, as you as you admit. Yes. Uh, so this this did, this incident did not take place in the holy of holies, but in the holy place. But Therefore, however, been... however, however, in the day of atonement, in the day of atonement, um, generally. Um, people generally at that particular day they would stand the, that the, the incense where the table of incense is is generally where the curtain is. So the curtain would be open that day, would be spread open, and only one person because and the entire place would actually become the holy of holies. Would you agree with that? Could you just explain that one more time, please, Stanley. In the day of atonement, that particular day of atonement. Mm-hmm. When one goes into the entire holy, the holy place, and the holy of holy place, the thing that se- the the, um, the curtain that separates the two places would the curtain would open up, and that would make it one big place. And yeah, the well, table, go ahead. according to Talmudic literature and history from the period, um, Alfred Edersheim and these types of historians from that. Speaking of that era, the, the curtain was not open uh, the, because the curtain was two great big, great big sheets of material, and the priest had to go in one side, walk down it. It was basically a narrow pathway which was between both sections of this mm. huge curtain, and then they would go around uh, through the other end of that, and then into the holy of holies. So no, no, the curtain was open, and in fact, again, looking at literature commentaries from that era, there was uh, mm-hmm. a legend that. They would tie a rope onto the yes. ankle of, yes. of this priest in case he were to die. Then they could pull him out without going they in. They could pull him out. So they, exactly. Yeah. And so there was. Uh, so the people outside couldn't see in. And it seems to be from the history about the temple in that period, the pre-destruction era by the Romans, that that uh, there was no that, that that veil did not get open. It was always in place. The only time the veil was removed was when. Um, uh, the tabernacle in the wilderness was taken down to to be relocated during the journey in the wilderness. Wow, I, I never I, I never understood it this way. Never from my studies of it, I always understood that on the day of atonement, the, the sheet the, the curtains opened up, and that place became one um, big big case. So when the Shekinah glory would show, that those that are outside of the temple would not be able to go in to see that, but only one individual was able to go out. That's why we can read in that story here that everybody was waiting outside for him. So if, if it was only, if there were only just a, a couple of priests that were in the holy place, then it wouldn't be a group of people, a good amount of people waiting for him. They would be outside of this place here. These are a lot of people that were outside of the, of the, of the entire holy of holies and the holy place. Waiting yeah, they would have been in the court, they would have been in the court of the Gentiles um, at the very least. Yes, the outer court. Exactly, they, they would be in the outer court. So, um, mm-hmm. and that's why it, um, that's why I, I that, that's why I see I can see him standing on the right side, which would still be facing the um, the the, um, the temple of God. It would be still yet, facing not- that section. And, and facing is fine, okay, even if, uh, and I, I, I can't concede your point, but I can't, can't continue to argue that the curtain was there. Even if the curtain were open, as you suggest, mm-hmm. um, still the altar of incense was not in the proper Holy of Holies. There was no biblical injunction to keep uh, a second or a helping priest out mm-hmm. of that area, even during the Day of Atonement. Mm-hmm. Okay, I guess, I'll, I guess I'll do some more studies on that. Um, yeah, as well, Stanley, you, you raise good points. Yeah, hold on, gentlemen, right. hold on, gentlemen. We have a caller, actually. Uh, we have a caller, uh, 315. You're live on the Bay Talk for you, 315. you have any questions or comments? Yeah, um, Shabbat Shalom to all. Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Well, Shabbat Shalom. Mm-hmm. All right, um, my question is, I don't have the scriptures with me right now, but um, the the burning bush. Um, when Moses was talking to the burning bush, it was said that it was God. But later in Exodus, you can read that it was an angel. So are you telling me that the burning bush, there was a man in the burning bush or an angelic being in the burning bush? 
Um, who are you relating to, Stanley or Jim? Who was relating the question yeah. to? Okay. Yeah, so that's a good question. As Stanley outlined in the outset of his seven-minute introduction, um, oftentimes when there's a supernatural presence that's depicted as an angel in the in the language of English, it in fact is a an emanation of the Creator, because God can appear as anything He wants, any place, any time, as much in as great a volume or as low a volume as he wants and that I mean we see that case after case we see the Lord appeared as as a human to uh, Hagar in the wilderness to Jacob to Abraham uh, the God God appeared in a pillar of fire in a burning bush in a in a uh, cloud of uh, cloud by day to guide the Israelites so so the if if this God that I believe in is in fact a God that I can believe in. He can do and be and show up as anything. Any, he can show up as 185,000 angels in a vision to, to disrupt an, an army, or he can show up as a small whispering wind. He could show up as a dog if he wanted. Uh, I, I, I don't know of any case that he has, mind you, but... <laughs> um, uh, and, and I mean, to dis- I, 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 I guess Stanley, um, you did, as I said, did well in articulating at the outset the angels in part of my depiction or understanding is Yahweh's it's it's him it is a portion an aspect facet of him but if you believe that the angels are humans as you just said the angel Gabriel was a human then it had to be a man in that bush because it clearly says I don't know where in the in Exodus that that was clearly an angel of God speaking to um, Moses so it would have to be a man speaking to God to to Moses. It would be have to be a man speaking to Moses if, from your point of view. Is that is that the case? No, that, I don't believe that was the case. I believe Moses encountered a divine presence, but it wasn't an angel. Well, it was a messenger. The word malach that you're reading there in Exodus, it's a Hebrew word malach. And if you look at all the Hebrew scholars from the period uh, that speak of the period, in fact. <clears throat> Kaufman Kohler is one of the excellent ones that speaks of that era. The word malak was in reference to a human in almost every case. It was sometimes a reference to the divine appearing in some form that appeared supernatural, but the word simply meant messenger. It never meant a supernatural cosmic thing that could fly through the cosmos, go from heaven to earth, be the uh, the one that speaks to God on behalf of men sometimes. And, and that's just the... That's the clear and simple history of the word malak that was used in the pre-Persian period when the Hebrew people began to take on distorted Persian mysticism. Oh, uh, can I jump in there for a second? Yeah, like yeah what's your take on that, Sam? Yeah, what's your take on um, that? Um, and I, I agree that the word malak means messenger, but, but you, just, you just gave us um, what the young, the young brother just um, stated that. In that text there, the malak was in this case, was a supernatural being. So, um, according to what your statement is, Malak, it seems to me as well, at least, what you're saying is that Malak is is, is not referring to a, a supernatural being, but yet, in this case, it is. And All right. Uh, much, correct? Yeah, go ahead, Jim. You can respond. Uh, well, as I'm saying, it may be a supernatural representation of the Father, but not a specifically set apart, created being that has godlike qualities and potentials. It is, it is God giving some type of a manifest, manifest form that appears as a messenger, which we only have the. We're, we're, it's, it's actually we have the distress of dismantling the English term breaking it back down, finding how the Latin and Greek used it, then going back to the Hebrew and determining uh, exactly what that word was meant to be. And, and yeah, it, it could have, I'm not saying it's not supernatural, but I'm just saying it's not a, a, an, a separate personal cosmic entity. But the Creator but God... That, if, I, was gonna, I was going to interject this hard. But wouldn't that um, disprove the idea of it being a messenger? Because if... If I am coming to speak to you about a message that I have for you, um, would I be considered a messenger of what I have to say? Because it seems to me that a messenger would be a part of a person, another another individual telling me to, to give the message. But if I'm saying I'm, this is a messenger, that means someone else has given that individual a message to provide it, but rather not the individual themselves 
with their own message and they'd be calling themselves a messenger. I don't know. It just doesn't seem, seem, seem I don't know. What, what do you think? What's your point on that? Well, you know, it it may not seem like it's uh, uh, anything other than a part of an individual person, but uh, the 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 fact that the Lord can be a messenger on His own, and the and the and the Malak, the messenger. In fact, that that's the that's the the first meaning of the word in Hebrew is messenger. The messenger of Yahweh appeared unto him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush, yeah. and he looked, and behold, the bush burned with fire, and the bush was not consumed. And Moses said, I'll now turn. So, so uh, what we can see is that this messenger component, this creator is giving a message to Moses. And he gives messages to people all the time through scripture um, because that's his role is to, he always speaks to his prophets, right? Uh, he, yeah. he, he says, I will inform my prophets before time what's to happen. And, and But he also does tell us that the spirit of the prophet is subject to the prophet, meaning that person can choose whether or not to hear the message and how to interpret it as well. But um, but the term itself, angel of the Lord, or malak of Yahweh, shows you a separation between the two, don't you think? Uh, I, you know what, if you look at the Hebrew, it doesn't say angel of the, it just says when the angel Yahweh, if we're going to go with the Hebrew, let's do that. It says, and the malak Yahweh, appeared into the hymn in the flames. Ah. The, words, the, the words of the aren't in the Hebrew, but they're Got added it. in English because yeah, because we we people, we had to try to put the pieces together on our belief on angels and make it fit. But it's, uh, and I, 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 that's just exactly how I see it written in the Hebrew. Okay. All righty. Um, yeah, we, uh, we have a few more callers. callers. Yeah, we have a few more callers. Um, once again, for the people that are joining in, uh, the title of the show is called Is Satan Real? Uh, if you want to ask a question, the number is 877-280-9681. That's 877-280-9681. Now, for those of you that I uh, add into the conversation and you already asked your question, uh, just do me a favor. Press the number one once again, and that will let me know that, you know, you have no further questions. So if you already asked your question, just press the number one again, and that will, you know, get you off the switchboard so I can know you're, already, you're done with your questions. Okay, let's go on to the next person. Let's see. Uh, Three one five four six zero. You're live on debate talk for you. Three one five four six zero. I like to say Shabbat Shalom, everybody. Uh, I had a question for the uh, the guy who believe doesn't believe that Satan exists. Uh, I came into the room kind of late, so I'm not sure if you guys t- touched on this subject. But what I want him to answer is, uh, who was the who was it that took Christ up into the exceedingly high mountain? Where it says the devil took Christ up into an exceedingly high mountain, uh, who do you believe that was? What I believe about that, and thanks for the question. What's your name, sir? Oh, my name is Brother Sha'ala. Brother Sha'ala, great to hear from you. Uh, now, do you want the explanation of why I believe it or just what I believe it was, Brother Sha'ala? Yeah, I just, you know, because I was always, you know, taught that that was Satan that brought him up into the exceedingly high mountain and tempted him. So I just wanted to know, do you believe that was Satan, or what do you believe that was? You know, I believe that that was the religious leaders of the day. The religious leaders of the day had the power to basically run the political religious environment. And it tells us in two of the Gospels, actually three times it says uh, after the 40 days, and Christ was, and Yeshua, Jesus was hungered. Uh, then, it says, the devil came to him to tempt him. Now, the word devil, diablos, just simply means opposer, someone opposing him. Uh, the word satan, satanus, is a Greek word. It comes from the Hebrew satan, and it simply means adversary. That's why Christ called Peter Satan at one point. But these, these Pharisees, in, the whole story starts, though, Brother Shahala, when Christ comes to the Jordan to get baptized, the scribes and Pharisees are standing on the shoreline, and it says they're jealous. We see that they're jealous. Now, Proverbs tell us anger we can withstand, but jealousy holds no bounds. So these jealous scribes and Pharisees see John uplifting this, this, this great teacher that's coming on the scene, and uh, he says, hey, here's the one, the lamb that's going to take away the sins of the world. And the scribes and Pharisees don't want Christ to be the, 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 the Messiah because he doesn't follow their religion. So then it says in Matthew 3, and then, as it were, uh, 
the, it says the spirit, I believe the spirit of the Lord, I don't open it up in front of me, the spirit of the Lord took Yeshua into the wilderness. So now, it's not got anything to do with Satan taking him there, first of all. It says he spends 40 days, he gets hungry. And then we have the testing, is what it is. The word terazzo in that passage is testing. We, we read it as tempting. And that he's tested is a very big, clear sign because we find that same word parazzo is used of the Pharisees nine times and the scribes throughout the New Testament. It says, and they, they, they asked Yeshua this so that they might parazzo him, tempt him, test him. The funny thing is the only place we see it inter- interpreted as tempt is in that story in the wilderness. So this Messiah, per- because the Pharisees, folks, if we look at the history in that era, the Pharisees had a group of men set apart, and their job was whenever someone came along that people thought was the Messiah, and there was lots of guys that thought they were the Messiah in the first century, it was their job to test the candidate for Messiah. And the rabbinic writings show some of their tests were if he could turn stones to, to food, if he could jump from a high place and live, he's the Messiah. Just like further on in the Gospels, we see um, they're marveling at him when he puts saliva on on some dirt and rubs it on a blind guy's eyes because one of the tests was if the Messiah, if a man can heal somebody's blindness with his saliva, he's the Messiah. And so these are all the tests they kept applying to him. So I believe it was the Diablos that was testing him after the wilderness was human men, the Pharisees. Yeah, we have a few more callers. Uh, the number is 877-280-9681. Once again, for those of you who just uh, asked their questions, just press number one. And that'll let me know you're done with uh, asking the question. All right, go to the next caller. Um, can, I, can I address that point quickly? Yeah, you can address that. Guy. Um, you know, um, <clears throat> and, and I think the explanation was pretty, um, very, very exhaustive. I'm sure there's more to the answer if because the time is limited. <clears throat> but um, when I read um, Luke chapter four, verse five, it says the devil <clears throat> taking him up into a high mountain showed unto him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. Now, this is interesting because this is telling him that all the kingdoms is being shown to Jesus in a moment of time. That seemed like a miraculous event here, which I don't believe the Pharisees had the, um, that kind of power to do, you know, um, first, not, let alone bringing them you know, um, just just the idea of showing them the, all the kingdoms, that's number one, and two, in a moment of time. You know, um, how do you explain that quickly, Jim? I know you want to go to the caller. But... <laughs> yeah, Jim. Yeah, well, well, quickly, I would say that the uh, the Christ figure was basically asked, "Hey, we'll give you all this. You can you can rule all this if you just follow our religion, because it's not possible from any high mountain to see the entire world." First of all, all the kingdom of the world. So all the all I suggest they were looking over was the the seeable land, and uh, in that point of time is what the the Greek word means. In that point of time, they were able to say, "Hey, if you want to come into our our team, then you get to have be part of this great kingdom, and you can uh, you can rule it." Because the devil did the devil have power over that? Was was it the devil's to show? And further to that, Stanley, if the devil can do this, if there's a supernatural Satan that can show you and I um, mystical visions of stuff, Mm -hmm. then we've just given that that character an attribute of God. And the creator God says there's none like him. I do all these things. I created peace and evil. He says, I I, I I want to address that point. I want to address that point because I I, I, it's actually part of my plan to address that point. Sure. Um, And and, and I I want to say this clearly, that just because um, a person has an attribute or does something like God does doesn't mean that they are equal to God or of, of God or clearly. I, I'm a, I'm a, I can give you some really very simple examples. Because yeah, um, I just I'm, hang I'm on, sure I didn't say equal. I'm not saying equal to God. Just I just want to be clear. Like I've never... God, or even like God or even um, somewhat like a God because this is an, an attribute that you have that God does. Um, I, and um, I can give you examples. I'm sure you are able, I don't know if you're blind or not, but I doubt that you are blind. I've seen your videos. You seem like your, your eyes work well. Uh, <laughs> and you, you're reading the scriptures well. I mean, you can see. 
but and I believe God can see too. But I'm not attributing us because you're able to do something God can do. Oh, you then I'm, I must be saying that you are God as well. Or I'm, you you can breathe and God breathes. You can think and God thinks. Whoa, I'm giving you more attributes. Am I saying that? Oh, I must be saying that Jim is God now because he can do something that God can do. No, not necessarily. Um, when God says, and I believe that when God says that no one is like me, um, doesn't necessarily mean that nobody has certain things I can do, but rather nobody is almighty. Nobody can do all the things I can do. Nobody can, you know, um, we can see in the situation of Moses when, 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 when he went, that they were, they were able to, um, a lot of the, um, the magicians were able to perform miracles just like Moses were, but doesn't necessarily, but they showed you that they couldn't do all of it. And that made a distinction between them and God. So I, I, it's, it's, it's just because one has an attribute, it doesn't necessarily mean that they're saying that, okay, then we must be saying that they are God. And at the same time, um, just, um, the, the, attrib- the attribute alone does not necessarily consist that you have to be God because there were gods that were worshipped, um, like Baal, an idol that couldn't see, taste, do or anything. And yet they were put in the position of being a god. So, um, so here's a situation where they were not given no attributes of the Most High, and yet they were still being able to call it God. So, so the, the attribute is not the test of whether or not one is God or not, is but rather how one is treating that individual. Are they serving that individual, or, and, and they raising them as God? Even Jesus recognized that people make money God, you know. Um, so, and even Paul said that that um, Satan is a god of this world. He's recognized as God by Paul because others recognize him that way, but not necessarily he. He doesn't recognize Satan that way. So I, so, um, I don't believe that's a good argument to support the idea because if one is called a god, that, that we're considering him to be god to us, but rather one others see him that way, and that makes it um, a god. Yeah, we're gonna uh, let you uh, jump back in, uh, Ray Shaw. I just want to take another caller. I'm gonna let you run oh, by sure. in a few minutes. But um, let me get another caller here. Three one three, three one three. You live on debate talk for you. You have any questions or comments? Shalom, brothers and sisters. Um, basically, I'm just, <laughs> one, just wondering. Um, I believe it is a, a, a physical Satan because he's described. Um, in the apocalypse of Elijah as being a man with skinny legs, a man that is able to pretty much um, metamorphose himself from being a, a small child to an old man, but that the great the gray turf on his head uh, would never change. Even when he metamorphosed, uh, he would still have that gray spot, uh, that gray patch of hair in his head. And... Um, also, that it describes him as, as being a physical individual who will stand in the Holy Land and um, be the abomination of desolation to call himself God. Um, so ultimately, the spirit of Satan is, is within him. Um, but my question is, I have a question that is pertaining to it, but a bit off topic, you know, but you guys seem really smart, and I'm really torn, and I pray for an answer. Um, is there a place of safety? Because um, the scriptures speak of a wilderness that the Most High will come down and plead with us uh, face-to-face, and there will also be a purging, and that it will be the wilderness of our forefathers. Um, And that for a time, time, and half a time, uh, the people will be nourished in that wilderness, and the ones who don't make it there, the beast is going to go and make war with the remnant of her seed. Is there a place of safety? And if so, is that place Mount Sinai? Yeah, Jim, we can go ahead. I, I believe that place of safety is hiding herself in the truth of scriptures and the truth that we are agreeing that there's one God and the Messiah is our access to that, believing we can't save ourselves. Uh, I don't believe it's a physical place of safety so much um, because we avoid once we once we once we come into the truth that's that's there for us to understand, uh, then we start to enjoy that safety because we now have a uh, some type of a protection from deception. 
And that, that beast that chases the woman is a prophetic vision indeed uh, that you spoke of. Uh, and we find that that vision to be referring to the the Roman emperor, the Roman Empire in John's day, and actually an, a more ancient reference, a previous reference to when uh, when the Mary and Joseph were pursued by the Pharaoh and his henchmen when uh, little Yeshua was born. Yes, right. Dan, you want to take a stab at it? Um, I actually don't want to because I really believe that that's going to be um, a lot of time wasted in um, dealing with another topic right now because this is a very important, a very yeah. important topic, and, um, I, and, I, and, I, and I want to get right back into it. Yeah, definitely. All right, well, 313, thank you for your call and your question. Um, I want to move on to the next caller. We have a lot of calls here. Um, 770, you're live on Debate Talk for you, 770. Uh, hello, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay, um... I just want to say um, Shalom, Fal, Shalom, Stanley, and Shalom, um, Jim. This is Brother Josh. Hey, what's going hey, on, Brother Josh? Josh? What's going on, Brother? Oh, nothing. It's all good. Um, I got a question for um, Jim. I just want to make sure I understand his position. Um, and I'm going to read something, too. First, um, Jim, are you saying that in the scriptures, the Hebrew word Melach and the Greek word Angelos exclusively refers to mortal man and never did the Hebrew Israelites believe that it was supernatural beings. Is that what you're saying? You have a couple questions there. I believe I believe the words that you just spoke of, Balak and Agelos, refer to either mortal man or to uh, a presence or manifestation of the divine God. And uh, I do also believe that the Hebrew people, once they became Hellenized or Persianized, many of them did believe there were these other supernatural beings. And we find that very clear in rabbinic Judaism today and the Kabbalistic Judaism that uh, proliferates throughout this New Age culture. Oh, okay, so what you're saying is that the Hebrews before their time did not believe, before they became Hellenized, did not believe that um, angels were like, individual spirits or anything like that, because there's something I want to read. Uh, if you would, both of you, could you turn to Psalms 104 and um, verse 4? And there's one more thing I want to read after that. Just one more thing, because I don't want to take up too many people's back. I know it's going to hold. Just read. Just read what you get there. Uh, Stan, if you would read it. Yes. It says, Who maketh his angels spirits, his ministers of flaming fire? Now, it says right here that God maketh his angel spirit, his ministers of flame and fire. Now, it also tells you that God is a spirit. But it's telling you right here that he make his angels or messengers spirit. We know mortal man is opposed to being a spirit. A spirit is the opposite of a mortal. Everybody knows that. Like a spirit, you know, a ghost, God. It says he make of his angel spirit. So how can a mortal man be a spirit just like God? Well, quite easily, both the Hebrew and Greek words represent the breath that sustains man in many ways. Uh, we have, again, we have our we have our, our kind of uh, distorted, Hellenized, Greco-Roman Western view that anytime we see the word spirit, it's referring to this airy fairy kind of uh, whispery thing that flits through the air. Um, it's it's quite simple to find where that word ruach is used. It doesn't have to refer yeah. to. But it said he make his, it didn't say he put spirits inside the angels. It said he make his angel spirit. I'm pretty sure you'd agree that me putting something in you is different from you making you that. That's not the same well, yeah, thing. Well, it, making you a dog or putting a dog inside of you are two different things. Would you agree? Oh, I do agree. Okay, but it says right here he make his angel spirits. What you're reading it to say is that he put his spirit inside of us. That's not what this is saying. It's that he make his angels into spirits. That's what they're saying. No, Just like God. No, that, that, and, I'm, and I'm not reading it as you suggest, but if we use the word malak and we use the word spirit and we find the word minister right after that, okay, the ministers are those are those humans that bring the message, that have the breath of the okay, Creator. Okay, okay. Well, just one more thing. Um, Acts 23, and I'm done. Acts 23. And um, verse 8. Now, these are the Sadducees and the Pharisees. And I'm surprised that nobody has called in yet and recognized that this guy, Jim, is trying to teach y'all neo-Sadducism. 
I hope y'all understand that. This is what he's teaching, neo fascism. He's teaching exactly what the Sadducees teach. I hope y'all understand that. I'm pointing it out too. Oh, uh, this is uh, Acts no. 23. At, uh, no, I gotta cut 8. you off. Hey, I gotta cut you off. I believe. Okay, wait, wait, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Hold I just on. Let, read let, this. Hold on. Let them respond. Hold on. Yeah, you, you just flatly accuse me of something that you're saying. The, the Sadducees say that there's no resurrection. I've never said that. No, 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 no. I didn't know. I said you, you're teaching. You just the said same, I'm teaching. I said you're teaching the same thing the Sadducees teach. I didn't say you're teaching everything. I just said neo fascism but this is well, what I'm you're talking teaching about. the same thing as the Pharisees 23. teach. Okay, Acts 23, but I'm so, I'm, there's a point I'm going here. Stanley, could you read that for me, Acts 23 and verse 8, please? It says, um, for the Sadducees say that there is no resurrection, neither angel nor spirit. Now, if, the, the, if the Hebrews only believed that angels meant messenger or, or, or mortal messenger, are you trying to tell us that the Sadducees didn't believe in mortal messengers of God? Yeah, just can you ask that one more time for me, please? It says right here that the it says for the Sadducees say that there is no resurrection, neither angel nor spirit. Now, if you're telling us that angel exclusively means just a mortal messenger of God, are you telling us that the Sadducees did not believe in mortal messengers? Because it's telling you that they did not believe in this. Whatever angel this is talking about right here is something that the Sadducees didn't believe in. And historically, we know the Sadducees believed in the prophets, and they were mortal messengers. But it's telling you right here that they did not believe in a certain aspect of the angel or angelo. This is clearly a reference to spiritual things. The resurrection is spiritual, angels are spiritual, and spirit or ghost or Holy Spirit is spiritual. So if you're telling us that the, ain't the word angel exclusively means only mortal messenger, then you're trying to get us to think that the Sadducees didn't believe in the mortal messengers of God, and that's historically inaccurate. That's all for me. That's I all never, I got to say. I've never, I've never told yeah. you that it means exclusively that. Have you listened to the previous uh, hour of the broadcast? I answered that twice, actually, that uh, the angels, there were there were sectors of the Hebrew people that believed the, the Malak had a spirit component. There were many sectors that didn't, and the Sadducees were one of them that didn't believe there was some type of ethereal component to an angelic being such as Christianity teaches today. I didn't give an exclusivity to you. I explained the differences, I think, clearly on a couple occasions. Yeah, thank you, Brother Josh, for your call. We've got to move on to the next caller, but uh, I'm going to let Stanley uh, come, uh, come in. You want to add something to that, Stanley? Yeah, um, pretty <clears throat> much... Um, and this pretty much would lead to the um the discussion that we left off with um brother um about the possession you know of situations of possession. I definitely want to um address that because I think that's very important <laughs> because if angels um you do you uh, according to what I'm hearing here um you believe angels do exist, but they they don't exist in the in a separate entity but rather. They are just manifestations of God. <laughs> but <laughs> if that's the case, that would have to talk about fallen angels <laughs> as well as angels. Sure. And that's, that's what the show is about. So, is real. Yeah. so um, now, in many of the cases that we see of possessions, it's always referred to, from my studies, as fallen angels. So I want to continue with that conversation um, with the fallen angels possessing people because not only in the scriptures were they possessed, they're still being possessed today. And, um, and there are many testimonies that it's all around the world. You, you can see in a lot of witchcraft cultures where this are ha these things are happening, where people have no knowledge of you at all. And you can tell they are wicked by the thing that they're doing and saying, and they're coming up with information where no human intellect would be able to, to, to follow. If I know everything about you, Jay, um, everything that's going on in your home, uh, obviously I'm being used by some kind of divine information, either from God or from a wicked spirit. So if the spirit is going against every being of every precept of God, it's, it could not be of God. It has to be something of someone else. What, are you, what is your response to that? Well, first of all, my response is what, you, what you're sharing is anecdotal evidence. 
family. Mm-hmm. These these evidences of supposed demonic possession, where a demon knows everything about someone, they're, they've been shown to be embellished in many occasions. And what happens in these demonic possession instances? And and, and I used to be part of a demon busting team in a Pentecostal church for many many years, as mm-hmm. a high level spiritual warfare participant. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. And and what I what I learned through my experiences that was that when a person comes to receive deliverance because they believe they're possessed. And the people that are offering that deliverance because they believe a person is filled with a demon, then we both, we actually, what we do is we, we have a reciprocating agreement. It's unspoken, but we're, we're being fed information that we're reacting on from the person's behavior. And they have this, this image in their head of how a demon-possessed person is supposed to behave. And then we feed information back to them. And what happens in a group, I found many times where the, the stories were, they were simply correlating or corroborating uh, <laughs> evidence to try, to try to ensure that we believed that there was a true possession taking place, that we had spiritual power over, and uh, that, uh, that what, we, what that person was delivering was information that no one else could have ever known. And I do an excellent <laughs> coverage of the Witch of Endor, for instance, uh, if you read uh, Volume 2, Imagine There's No Satan, uh, it discloses exactly how this takes place, how, how witches, psychics, and supposed demon-possessed people uh, seemingly have information when, in fact, there's, there's been nothing that's evidenced in proof. It's always anecdotal. Um, do you agree that um, Josephus um, understood that the mind of the people in the time understood that, like in the situation of the Witch of Endor, that was really a situation where um, that involved um, a spiritual action that happened. Where Oh, I understand. The- yeah, Josephus does state that. I know that for sure he does. <clears throat> does okay, it make it so true that- because he stated it? No, no, but, uh, but at least we can understand that that was an understanding of, of, a, of, a, of a Hebrew at the time. It was an uh, of some Hebrews, we, we can't paint them all with the same brush. I don't think that's fair. I agree. There is, I agree with yeah, that. Yeah, there's a there's a, a, a yeah, there's a lot of that, them that really didn't adhere to the Josephus because um, Josephus was working for the Romans, right, as a historian, and he was part of the contention of him was that he was a fully Hellenized Jew, so he had lots of lots of Hellenistic thinking in his belief system. But at the same time, at the, at the same time, a lot of things that he believed could be true as well that you don't believe, that you don't agree with. It's a possibility. Yeah? True. true. Yeah. Oh, yeah, Stanley. I okay. totally. Okay. And here's a big point. You're right. It's a possibility. But and that's why I have a four volume series of evidence that dismantles every one of these things in great detail, um, which I, I know you haven't had time to read all of them, Stanley. But uh, when we come into debates. Um, I'm never I'm never afforded the privilege of hours and hours of time that a reader would have by sitting down and going through saying, well, maybe it's true that there's one God and no Satan. And, and we didn't get to finish talking about how there being a Satan in this world means there's more than one God. Uh, but uh, that might have to be another time. But you're about to jump into more of this. Go ahead, Stanley. Yeah, I, I definitely want to um, speak on that um, this, that, that point of um, the possession situation in the Bible. There were many cases in Scripture where people were possessed by demons, and they were speaking certain things that, again, that these individuals that were possessed had not, no knowledge of. You know what I mean? They knew that this, this, these individuals knew that were possessed, like Legion, knew the one that was possessed with Legion. Um, in the Bible, you're the saying there are as many cases? Yeah, in the Bible. Can you give a... Yeah, where, where the demons were, were... Like, we can go back into the story of Legion, um, the Legion story, because we we were. I want to c- continue to where we left off in the conversation in the last to- topic. Sure. Um, in the last discussion. Um, and um, and I was listening to it again and some of the things that you were saying, and I, I want to quote something you stated, which was, which I which I I noticed I researched and it was inaccurate. Um, sure. You stated that. Um, in the last episode, you said it, the word enter, when the when lesion asked to be entered into the pigs, you said it was an Aramaic word that means to attack. Am I correct? Is that what you said? That is what I said. Okay. Um, I looked up the words in those texts, and I looked up the word enter, and one of the Gospels didn't say enter, but rather said something different. It says go into him or something like that. And, um, and in all these areas, it never met 
in the definition. It never meant to attack. Um, um, Did you I look it up in the what? Aramaic, Tammy? Well, Did you look it up in the um, Aramaic versions of well, – there's Aramaic well, the versions of the New Testament, right? No. Um, it was the Greek. Yeah, well, you can't, you can't get the Aramaic meaning from the Greek word. I'm, I'm telling you, that's why I was able to express last time that the culture that Re- Messiah and his apostles were living in was an Aramaic culture. And oh, the words that's the Greek translation? I've never said that either. I accept that the Greek – does give us the story that took place. but in, And it just so happens that the Greek was not the language that Christ and the apostles spoke for teaching, Stanley. The teaching language by the Messiah was, a, was an Aramaic and a, or, or a Hebraic dialect. And um, he would have that spoken thought. that. I understand. There is a Pardon? problem with that thought. The Bible that we're reading now, the King James Bible that we're reading now, was the New Testament, the entirety was written in Greek. So then you would actually have to have an Aramaic version of the entire New Testament, and that be translated in English. Because, um, Shall I send you English- one? I, I, there's, there's, there, they are available, Stanley, and in fact, the, the Eastern Orthodox uh, believers use an Aramaic text. They use the Aramaic Gospels. Have been, uh, they, it's, quite, it's quite a prolific actual uh, series of scholarship or body of scholarship how the Aramaic versions are quite different than the uh, the Greek versions, and we somehow think the Greek is the inspired version, Stanley. And and there's there's never anyone that says that because, as you know, none of it was written into Scripture until uh, at the earliest late first century, possibly early second century, and that was long after that the the Jews had been expunged from or expelled from uh, Jerusalem and Judea, and Rome Rome then took over, basically managing all religion. Well, that's really that, – that, what you're saying there is extremely interesting to me because now what I'm getting from your statement is that the New Testament that's been translated from English – from the Greek to English is not God's inspired word. That's what I'm getting here now. Am I correct? No, well, I'm, I'm not saying it's not God's inspired word, Stanley. What I'm saying is it's not God's inspired word language, that Greek language, which we take all our definitions from, only because we believe Greek was uh, the language Christ spoke in. But scholar after scholar today is coming out and saying, oh yeah, we find out he was Aramaic, he spoke Aramaic. But it just so happens, the Aramaic wasn't written down the day he spoke it. It wasn't until years after, till the Greeks were ruling all religions, Stanley. And so when they wrote down this, these these stories that the apostles and their descendants had shared, guess what language they wrote it down in? Greek. Uh, but it just so happens many Greek words don't do justice to an underlying Aramaic or Hebrew word. We, have to, we can't find out. It's, not, it's, it's, it's no help for us to determine what the Greek's saying when there's an underlying language beneath that that the speaker was speaking. And in fact, the entire New Testament has hundreds and hundreds of Hebraisms and Aramaicisms that, that identify to the linguists that the the, the 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 speakers were not speaking Greek. The, the, um, in actuality, I, I I respectfully disagree with that. With, with the fact that there were many instances where Christ was speaking to Greek speakers, he was speaking to Grecians. He was, um, and there were many. That, that was we find many cases where that was happening. Even Paul himself was speaking in Greek. He spoke Greek as well, and he spoke to many Greek believers. And Luke was also a Grecian. And he also spoke Greek as well. And, and, and so I believe that clearly the scriptures are clear that Christ was a speaker of Hebrew, he was a speaker of Greek, and he was a speaker of Aramaic. I believe he spoke all three languages. Um, there, there, there are many, we can find many encyclopedia that, that shows you um, that proof it's, itself that he spoke all three languages. He didn't only speak um, Aramaic or Hebrew, as, as if I'm getting from you. Yeah, let me, uh, yeah well, the predominant... In. Let me jump in. I have to get a you know a few of these calls. Only ten minutes left in the show. I'm gonna let you rebuttal, uh, Jim, in a few minutes. But let me just take another caller. Uh, two six nine, two six nine. You're live on debate talk for you. Two six nine. Yeah, peace. No, thank you for taking my call. Yeah, just a question for I guess that Stanley that's talking and the other guests as well. It uh, it appears that uh, you all are having a debate on a non-material beingness when you're talking about Satan's and spit and the uh, devils and demons, these are non material I guess energies or whatever. And so I guess the question is 
prior to these Satans and devils and beings entering into a material body, how do you define them outside of that, and what criteria did you use to identify them and define them if they're not inside of a a, a body? All right, 269, thank you for your call. Stanley, you can respond. I'm so sorry. Um, can you can you can you re, can you um, repeat you want to repeat that? Yeah. again? Yeah, two six nine. You can repeat your question. Yes, sir. This this definition that you're giving to of Satan and uh, evil uh, demons and spirits and things. If in fact these spirits and demons and Satan's are not inside of a human body, and they are some type of energy or force or something like that. How do you define them outside of a human body? If they're not inside of a human body, how do you define them and how did you uh, get a definition for them? Um, well, you see, I believe that so I'm, I'm, it's, it's kind of hard to um, understand the way the, the question is being asked, but um, I'm going to do the best I can to, to respond. And if you can, cor- you can correct me if I got, understand your question carefully. Um, what I, this is what I understand. Satan is an individual spirit that is able to possess the human body. He is also able to influence the human body. So, just, so when sin fell, in mankind, at the beginning, in um, the garden, sin came into mankind totally. So the influence of that sin has traveled from mankind to the point where the heart was continually wicked. So now we have the influence of Satan in our hearts, even even without Satan being inside of it. So Satan can can um, can influence from outside, and we also had a genetic now um, 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 being of sin. To also being led by the sinful lust of the human mind, so we have two things working together for the for the sake of sin and going and to be an adversary against God. So outside of the human body, he is a spirit entity that is an adversary of God. At the, but um, within the human body, he can possess it. At the same time, he can influence the mind to act the way according against God's will and his. And, and for us to also be adversaries as well uh, uh, um, for his side and, his, and to be his subject at the same time to be an adversary against God's will. So I believe um, he, can, he can be defined outside and inside. Hmm. Stanley, and then can I address that one, uh, Sal? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, so you're saying that, that something from outside man can defile man. Is that what I'm hearing, Stanley? Yes. Well, Christ himself said... Nothing from outside a man can defile man. He was confronted, if you recall, Stanley, by the Pharisees about his disciples not washing their hands before they ate. And uh, there was a view that the Pharisees had that humans would be defiled by spirit beings if they didn't wash their hands uh, before they ate. And he showed the ludicrousness of it. And he goes on to say, nothing from outside man can defile. Because... It's from evil, evil comes from within, from man's heart. And then he goes on to say adulteries, sorceries, lasciviousness, yes. uh, lying, okay. all of those things mm-hmm. come from, okay, they all come from inside. So if we've got, if there's another entity that can defile man and do and, and behave like a god in many ways, then we've got a secondary god, even though we don't believe it to be equal to Yahweh. Every time the no. Israelites, when, when the Israelites were wandering about, and they knew they had one sovereign God, but they they believed there were other gods that might harm them. They never believed in those gods. They believed they existed. And Yahweh said, don't believe there's other gods. There's no gods but me. There's only one. I, the Lord, do all these things. I do evil. I do good. And he, he um, always address, was reprimanding. I wanted to address one point. You said, I'm so sorry. that At one time you had corrected me and said that you don't you didn't say equal. But now you did say the word equal. So no, I, I did. I said he's not equal. I said even though he's not equal, I said not equal. No, 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 no. no. I'm saying you said you said that when we believe 
that he's able to work outside of man to defile a man. That we're now we're calling now we're saying that he was that there is another God that's equal to God. That's what you're saying. No, I said there's another God that's like God, Stanley. I never said equal. Well, you, said, you said the word equal. I, you know, I, I wish you could remind us, David. You said the word equal. I said, whoa, he said equal. Whoa, you, you yep. clearly said equal. Clearly said I'll that send word. you a free. I'll, I'll send you a free copy of my book if I said equal. That there's another one that's equal to God. I'm I'm saying there's none okay, like that. There's like not another God. one. There's, there's a li- yeah. like God. Go ahead Thank and redo the. Yeah, hold on. I got to take one more question. There's only five minutes left for the show. I'll take one more question. Four seven eight. You're live on debate talk for you. Uh, before you go in, if we we happen to go over in overtime, you can call in at six four six seven one six seven three two zero. It's going to cut off from the you know online. So if you want to call back in to listen into the extended part of the show, which is almost over, you can call in at six four six seven one six seven three two zero four seven eight. Uh, you're live on debate talk for you four seven eight. Um, Shabbat Shalom, everybody out there. This is Twan. And, um, hey, Antoine. Yeah, yeah, how's it going, everybody? Um, you Shabbat know, Shalom. I've been listening. You know, been listening for about an hour and a half right now. And correct me if I'm wrong. The title of the class, um, of this of this discussion is "Does Satan Exist?" Am I correct? Is Satan real? Yes. Is Satan real? Okay. Who well, about an hour and a half? I haven't heard too much about you know, <laughs> whether or not Satan is real or not. So, um, and I think a few callers tried to go back and, uh, and you know, try to get the focus back on it, and that's what I, I intend to do right here. Now, my question is to um, is to Jim, and uh, I haven't heard this stance too many times before, other than, of course, in Acts, in, in the book of Acts, but um, the, the, the Neil side of it, I haven't really heard it too much um, recently. But my question is, in, um, in Matthew chapter 25 and verse 31, um, Jesus Christ said, "Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels." Now, my question is, you know, that word "their devil" is um, translated from Diablos, and um, in my concordance, well, actually, in both of my concordance, it says um, used as a noun, and it says as a noun, Satan. In both of my concordances, my question is, um, from your understanding. Uh, is this Satan real? Is is it is it really a, a Satan? And if if so, um, you know, I mean, if not, I'm sorry. Then who are these angels, or who are his angels? Um, and the same thing for Stanley. You give me your understanding on this as well. Thank you. Just tell me that reference again. Matthew 25. What was the passage? And 41. 41. Uh, so yeah, and I, you know what I deal extensively with this. And who's the devil? Jesus do it's volume three of the Imaginal Satan series. And folks, if you're interested in exploring it, I'll send you a free ebook. Just email me or email Sal, and he'll email me, and I'll send it out to you. But yeah, then he shall say also unto them on the left hand, depart from me, you cursed, into everlasting fire prepared for the diablos and the messengers, the malak. Right. So. <laughs> If if we look at the context, we can begin to determine that there are, are people that are teaching wrong things all the time, and they're also called messengers. They're the opposing messengers is who they are. The Diablos is a traducer. That's one of the, the ways to define Diablos. Um, and, of course, then Strong says, yeah, specifically Satan. He adds the common belief of what devil is. He doesn't look at the ancient Hebraic belief. But uh, there is an everlasting fire, which is simply just a destruction. Uh, 1 Thessalonians 1.9, might be 2 Thessalonians 1.9, says the, the punishment of the wicked is the destruction from the presence of God forever. So what, according to this, there's this continually burning perpetual fire that's going to hurt some uh, supernatural being and his, his angels. When, and according to me, it's an opposer or a traducer a human, a human messenger who opposes the message of God. And that, that happens to any of us who oppose the message of God. In the end, when we die, if we don't agree with God, we so- somehow don't end up with God. So you're saying um, the, the trans... The, um, I'm <clears throat> sorry, Stanley. Are, are you saying no, no, the trans- no, 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 no. Here, where it says prepare for the devil here when it's... Uh, so you're saying the Strongs has it incorrect when it says uh, Satan here? Or are you saying that the I, definition of, uh, of Satan, we shouldn't be actually using the, the one where it says a noun, Satan, is we should actually be using um, traducer, is what you're saying. Because actually, I don't even have that um, that word in my concordance uh, here. Uh, so it just... But no, I'm just, I'm just trying to get your understanding of what, of what you're trying to say here. 
Yeah, no, so your concordance doesn't even use the word traducer in defining the word? Uh, not at all. Yeah, well, then there's a problem, right? Because if we're supposed to compare that word, if we look at if we look at the lexicons, it says this word is compared to the Hebrew word 7854. Okay, that Hebrew word 7854 uh is ap- absolutely not referring to a personal entity. Uh it's referring to the um that person. Uh it's actually the word Satan is what it is. So we have to follow the etymology of these words, friends. It's the word traducer or diablos there uh becomes in Hebrew the word Satan, which is simply an opponent. It was never a proper noun, uh, and we continue to push it into that proper noun category. And, and the Septuagint, yeah. and whenever whenever the, the, the Hebrew words were translated into Greek, they uh, they ended up using the word diablos for any time the word satan appeared, which only meant a human opponent. So, even, so if I read in the, the book of Job, um, when it's talking about Satan in the Septuagint, Every single time I read there, that's talking about uh, a human that actually came before the Lord. It's talking about a person that actually did that. That's right, it is. Uh, in fact, the before the Lord is a term well known by the ancient scholars. Before the Lord just meant human men at the temple or some kind of a temple. Being before the Lord meant there was men at the temple. In fact, if you if you go to your e-sword or your computer Bible and type in the phrase before the Lord, you'll find in every instance it refers to Moses or someone going into a temple environment to come to a, a, a place on earth where God's supposed to be represented. Okay. Um, Stanley, I'm going to let you respond, and then I'm going to take one more caller, and then I'm going to give you okay. guys like a few minutes for a final statement. Um, okay. You can respond, Stanley. Um, I, well, you see, I, I'm so sorry, but I want to go back to the, the, the statement that um, Jim made about the um, when, when I was asked about, um, can, and he asked me if Satan can defy from outside, because okay. um, the scripture he told me says that's, that that cannot be, because it, it said only within that can happen, but it cannot happen without. But the scripture didn't say that. It never said that it cannot happen from without. It was talking because nothing about from without defiles a man. That's not what it says. That's not what it says. So let's look at it. Let's look at it. Um, let's go to Matthew 15. Sure. It does not say the. It didn't say the word without. It's not even in there. Um, um, it says here. Um, verse. Look at verse. Verse eleven. It says, "Not that which goeth into the mouth defileth a man, but that which cometh out of the mouth, this defileth a man." Right. It says nothing yeah. about without here. And then, um, as you continue reading, let's see um, verses. He said, "Do you not understand?" Um, verse seventeen. He says, do, ye not, do not ye yet understand that whatsoever entereth into the mouth goes into the belly and cast out into the truck. But those things which proceed out of the mouth come from the heart, which, and they defile the man, which, which is the heart, proceed of thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications. So these are things which defile a man, but to eat with unwashed hands defileth not a man. So he was specifically focusing on tradition. He was not focusing on an idea that a person can lead you to sin. Um, um, there are many absolutely. cases. Um, I, I couldn't even give you a situation with Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve, um, because of Satan leading them, he was punished with that. He was punished for doing that. The serpent that did that. At the same time, when um, Eve had led her husband to do that, she was punished for doing that. One can lead another to sin. Um, I I can lead you to sin. Um, a, another, I don't even have to be the devil for that. And I will be held accountable for that. So here I am, being from without, can lead you to commit sin. You know, so in this case here, this was not focusing on a general perspective that something from outside you can never lead you to defile yourself. No, it has nothing to do with that because you even see in the book of Daniel that Daniel said he would not eat of the king's meat for it will defile me. Was that incorrect in that? No. He, was, he, he, he understood that there were certain things also that you can partake in that can defile you. Why? Because you're disobeying the Lord. So what Jesus was talking about was a 
different point of view because here they are imposing a tradition of you have to wash hands or you be an unclean, evil, wicked individual if you eat with unwashed hands. And Jesus said, that's not what makes you evil. That, he said, it is, the, it is the evil heart that causes you to commit sin that makes you do evil, that, that, that defiles you because you're definitely going to be lost. So this is what Jesus was saying. He was not disregarding an idea of one can influence you to be it. Satan can do that. And also people can do that. Not only Satan, but people. So I completely, respectfully disagree. I can see a completely misunderstanding of the scripture here. Because it doesn't, you're reading into the text a little bit deeper than it's supposed to. I, I, that's my view. Well, no, and Stanley, I understand that position in, in, intimately. But when we refuse to look at the context, what was Christ dealing with? He was dealing with the tradition that the Pharisees believed yes. demons. He believed demons would enter if people ate. The, the Pharisees believed demons would enter if the Pharisees, I'm uh, sorry, if they didn't wash their hands before they ate. So he was say completely. That. He was completely, I know it doesn't say that, but I'm telling you the tradition that the hist, historical records indicate that the Pharisees were contending about. Because their job was, they were always worried about people getting filled with these demons they thought existed. And so Christ, when they came out with this tradition, the whole tradition they're talking about was they thought demons would fill up a person if they didn't wash their hands before they ate. And that's why he goes right at it. He, he knows what they're talking about. He's hung around them enough, and he tells them, no. It's the stuff that's inside you that defiles. He he doesn't have to say it's not demons because his his retort clearly shows the logic of the Pharisees thinking that their tradition is wrong, that it's not an external thing that defiles a human, meaning filling them with demons. All right, I got to take one more question, and uh, we're gonna give you guys give you guys a final statement. Uh, five one zero, five one zero. You live on debate talk for you. Yes, I didn't hear you from the beginning. Um, I'm not. I'm just have a have a question. Do, does the gentleman or yourself do they believe that there are both there are demons outside of people that influence them, and that some demons can enter into people, and so they become possessed? Because I believe there might be both happening. I mean, you can see people that look like they have demons in them, the way their eyes turn black and the way they act and their whole energy is really, 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 really negative and hateful. And then I believe that other people can be oppressed, you know, from demons that are external to them. Mm-hmm. So could, could you address that? Yeah, Jim, you can respond to that. Yeah, well, if... In, in the view that I posit in my books, folks, the the fact that there's another entity who can enter inside a person like the Holy Spirit of God can is a, a great testimony to say that there's another God. And the God of creation says there's no gods. He does all those things. No one else can do. No other supernatural. And Stanley, he's addressing supernatural entities that, that, all the, that many Hebrew believers believed existed. He's not talking about humans who can do who can think like the creator can think in certain ways. And so, so the fact that, that um, their belief existed that demons might fill a person shows that people had a secondary God they believed in. And, and so I say no. I, I believe the creator's words were, were in context saying, you can't think there's other supernatural entities because I'm the only one. He can, in fact, it's in the Ten Commandments. Uh, there's, uh, there's have no God beside me. And he's not talking about worship because all the evidence we find from Israelites' journey through the wilderness, through other paganized cultures, every time they thought there might be another creator, or sorry, another another being, an entity, supernatural entity that could hurt them or harm them or cause trouble, our God came in and said, no, he, there's nothing else that does things. I do things. And he, he repeats it over and over. And, and uh, I'll, I'd love to email out, ebook copies of volume one where I explain and show how biblically that's exactly how having another God is defined. But you know, in Ephesians it talks about, you know, your enemies are not um in human form. They're in uh, principalities and powers within the spiritual realm. He's talking about Jesus. He's not talking about himself. Okay, okay. Uh, you broken up. She's breaking yeah, up. Okay, yeah, yeah. yeah, his phone is a little breaking up. Say that one more time. Five one zero. Oh, okay, hold on. Um, can you hear me now? Because I'm. Yeah. I'm, yeah, I can hear you now. Okay. Yes. 
Well, and I, I know I in, Ephesians, the... in Ephesians, I mean, the Lord states that your enemy is not against flesh and blood. It's about Amen. the powers and principalities in the heavenly realm. He's not talking about himself. He's talking about demonic spirits. Yeah. And, and um, secondly, um, I absolutely, because I've talked to people that have seen demons that have appeared, and I've, men and women, and I believe them. They're not crazy people at all. Mm-hmm. And they got rid of them by calling out uh, out to Jesus Christ's name and asking for help. And I mean, this is absolutely true. Um, there is a um, there is a, a book called "He Came to Set the Captives Free" by a physician. Uh, have you heard of her, Dr. Rebecca Brown? She fought demons yes, in a hospital. And she talks about how she brought one high-level satanic witch out of um, who was a head nurse in a in an ICU in a hospital, and um, brought her out through deliverance. But I mean, I just bought the book and started reading it. It's phenomenal. Now they called her crazy. The mayor, uh, the um, the uh, uh, medical board, and took her license. But if you see her on YouTube, she's not crazy at all. So I, that's why I'm saying, I'm saying that um, uh, I absolutely do believe because I've talked to people, and there's there's uh, there's another blog talk show where there's a prophetess, a, 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 a woman, who's saying she's getting so many phone calls from people now who are saying that they have seen demons, they are being terrorized, there's sex demons that are terrorizing people. She she's getting so many calls. They're terrorizing um, people at night, and um, it's not a figment of their imagination. Um, I, I like to, um, to add to that point. Can I? Is that? Yeah, that's Danny, and I'm going to let the um, uh, chair respond after that. Okay. Um, I, um, my family also um, are from Haiti, and this is something that we do recognize a lot is um, voodoo. Um, I, I even have people in my family that partakes in voodoo, and this is something that you see them involved in. That's, it gets really deep, and things around them are moving. There's no earthquakes around. You know, um, so there, there are definitely spirits around the area. And um, so um, for us, to, for us to, to, I just think we have to be very careful with this stuff here. And, I'm, and she, she points out a perfect scripture. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12 clearly says that we wrestle not against flesh and blood. This is talking about people, folks. She's saying, she's saying that we're not wrestling against the people, but there are principalities, powers, and rulers of the darkness of this world against spiritual wickedness in high places. This is talking about um, demons that are of different ranks of, 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 with a, in a different dimension that we cannot see with the physical eyes. The scriptures are very clear in these areas, and um, we, we have to go a, a, a long way out to, to, to really change these things in order for us to see it the way Brother Jim sees it, we would have to actually change a lot of the Bible. And that's how I You know, I in, that case, that. Stan, in that case, Stanley, uh, this Ephesians 6 passage, and, uh, mm-hmm. you know, you guys are great with the well what abouts, and again, there's hundreds of them. And please email me and go to my imaginalsatan.com website because I deal with the Ephesians 6 passage and explain that we only have to go as far as looking at the Greek words. Look at each of those words in the Greek, and you'll see they're referring to things here on earth. And here's proof of that. In Titus 3.1, when Paul himself is speaking again, he says, put them in mind to be subject to principalities and powers, to obey magistrates and be ready to every good work. Okay? But here in Ephesians, the verse that is used to make, cause people to say there must be real, because look, at, he says it's, uh, it's principalities and powers we're fighting against. And then in this very passage it says, be subject to principalities and powers, Titus 3, verse 1. So what is it? Is Paul want us to, to, uh, to be subject to principalities and powers, or, or does he want us to believe their spirit demons and, and have opposition to them? And, and um, he, so when we, we use, we rest, because he says we wrestle not against, but we wrestle against principalities and powers in Ephesians 6, 12. In Titus 3, 1, he says, be subject to principalities and powers. They're the same Greek words in both passages. Now, I assure you, if you examine carefully 
the cultural context Paul was dealing with here and look at carefully the Greek words in this particular case. And you if read, I'll, I'm happy to email you that chapter. Uh, you'll what see that these are dealing wickedness? with human... Can you explain that? Spiritual wickedness part? That's not inside us. Yeah, spiritual wickedness is referring to in high. In fact, the word places is not in the Greek. It's added in. In the King James Version, we can see that it's italicized, which means it's not in the Greek language. Um, we're dealing with um, against the rulers of darkness of this world. Okay, Those are the human rulers who, who give uh, false teaching. That's, that would be flesh spe- and blood. That would be flesh and blood in this case here. Pardon me? In this case here, according to you, if that would be human, then that would be flesh and blood. But according to the scriptures, we're not wrestling against flesh and blood. Right, we're not wrestling against humans. We're wrestling against a, a mindset <laughs> is what we're wrestling against, Stanley. We're not wrestling against that. We're not wrestling against oh, the Pharisee or the, or the Roman centurion who, who want us to do their thing. We're wrestling against the whole structure of false religion. Okay, yeah. that, that's yeah, I, see, I, see, I, see, I see your point. I see your point. Yeah, the principality is the word arche, and it's referring to the beginning or, or origins uh, of our of our false religion that we c- keep getting sucked in by over and over again. And the word powers is it's referring to the the a bit, the privilege it says the privilege to choose. So we're wrestling against that privilege we have to believe a lie, and and, it's, but, uh, and that's what Adam and Eve. It's interesting. I know, and, and I. I that you're telling me to to, um, to to consider the Greek there, but initially you were telling me that that wasn't their language. That I I did say that's not the language, but you can find the underlying meaning of these terms if you follow the Greek. The Greek is true to some words, Stanley. I didn't say every Greek word loses all meaning from the Aramaic or Hebrew underlying. I did say, though, we have to find out if the Greek is true in every sense to the Aramaic but or wouldn't Hebraic. But un- wouldn't that be kind of like, like, let's say, for instance, if I want to come up with a doctrine... Um, to say that God does not exist, and um, and I can I can use the scriptures, and then where where it kind of shows that it doesn't, I can use to say, well, don't go by the Greek here at this instance, but go by the, the Aramaic in this case here. But over here, you go by the Greek to support. Well, couldn't that happen as well? It could happen. You're right. That could happen. Now, if we can if we consider, as I've said several times, the historical, the cultural, the literary the linguistic, the social, and the religious context. These are six key items, friends, we have to really examine instead of believing that every doctrine Christianity is taught about this is accurate. Because when, when Rome took over religion after the destruction of, the, of Jerusalem, what we got was a, a religion about Jesus instead of the, the religion of Jesus. And it was infused with many, many Roman and Greco-Roman ideas that were borrowed from other pagan cultures. And so when we have a Greek term, oftentimes, and I never said every time, oftentimes the writer tried to interpret it maybe honorably, but but you know how we always often will interpret things and we infuse them with our own ideas about them? That has happened, and it's no secret anymore. And that's why we have today hundreds and hundreds, Stanley, you'll be the best one to know, hundreds of different versions of the Bible out there, Everybody's trying to reinterpret it, and, and uh, I'm not trying to reinterpret it. I'm not trying to change what the Bible says. I'm trying to say, let's examine it from the perspective of the writer based on the cultural things that were going on the moment he spoke the words that are now written in English for us to read. All right. Um, I know we went into the overtime part of the show, and I want to thank you guys for hanging in there, you know, my special guests as well, you know, for going into the overtime part of the show. But we're about to wrap this up. I'm going to give you guys a final statement. Um, I'm going to give you uh, five minutes each to uh, give your final statements. And I'm going to start with uh, Jim. You can give your final statement. Well, thanks. I'm not sure I'll take the whole five minutes. And, Stanley, feel free to take my extra time. Uh, it's been great being here, Sal. And, Stanley, you're uh, just a, a real uh, privilege to be able to dialogue with you and that you're not afraid of debate is is an exciting thing because this is an off switch for many. And, um, you know, there's a chance that I'm wrong. I've always admitted that, and I do so in my books. But I build mountains and mountains of evidence that examine this particular topic, if Satan is real or not, based on the original languages, the thinking that took place before the Hebrew people got trapped in Persia, Babylon and then Persia. And I put together that evidence in a, in a case that really is an A to Z. And um, it's, it's really easy for a man to defend his belief, but it, it takes a different level of 
fortitude to really scrutinize a belief and find out if our belief is true according to scripture or if our belief is a second-hand belief. And in that case, I found many people have realized they've been trying to fit scripture into their beliefs because our beliefs are so important to us. Instead of trying to find out, do my beliefs fit scripture? And it starts quite simply with the linguistics, the language. The, the, any word, anytime we see the word Satan in the New Testament, the underlying word is a Hebrew word, Satan. And the, the, the lexicons will tell us the exact same thing I'm saying. I'm not making this up. It says it's Satan. Then we have to find out what did Satan mean to the Hebrew thinker who was not thinking from a Hellenized or Persian perspective. Well, it simply meant some type of an adversary person or as in the case when God was called Satan by the chronicler, when the Creator Himself is adverse to a human. We can go through every New Testament reference, and I do that in Volumes 2 and 3 of the Imagine No Satan series, but we can't understand them unless we choose to understand what the Hebrew message of a Satan was in the Old Testament. Because, folks, we've gone far too, far too long in this world of Christendom where we believe the New Testament is there to inform what the Old Testament means. But I assure you, every sound biblical scholar says the Old Testament is the foundation for the New Testament, and therefore the language of that is as well. So when Christ and the apostles, when they were out teaching Scripture, they weren't teaching New Testament. They were teaching biblical Old Testament concepts that had been distorted by the false religion of the Pharisees, and the Pharisees then became the Satan. Because in fact, in, in the Old Testament, we see that term used, Satan, in many of the cases, it has a, a small Hebrew word, ha, before it, saying ha, Satan, telling us it's the Satan, the adversary. And it is, folks, false religion is our adversary. Our own evil inclination to justify making a wrong choice, wrong choice is our adversary, our Satan. Um, the, the, the draw to do things that go against Yahweh, God, the Creator, is our adversary. We were created with the potential to choose good or evil. And we, know, we need no external satanic cosmic entity to be tempting or testing or pushing us along we have our own sense of wanting to do what feels good for ourselves. And Paul declares it, sin is in my members, he says. Uh, he continually tells us that these are the things that are the problem. Why do I do that which I do not want to do? And he completely relates it to himself. It's his own human heart that has the inclination to choose things that are not pleasing to our God at times. Everyone does it, and you know what? We can go right back to the garden where we see that serpent spoken of and I deal with this in Volume 1 in two chapters, that serpent was a reference by Moses, the great prophetic leader who also spoke in parables and was, was, was learned in all the wisdom of Egypt. He knew to tell the story of some serpent entity that deceived Adam and Eve. In the hearers that were listening who came out of Egypt, they would have known that's a complete Egypt mode or motif that says, the serpent is our own evil inclination, our intention to stealthily justify evil. And the fact that there is only one God in creation has to come into play because he only seems to tell us that when the people are starting to point to other spiritual entities as having done something supernatural or brought harm. And then he says, no, no, I am Yahweh, I am one, there's no God but me none else in all the earth. And in fact, we see it quite clearly all the way in Revelation when the revelator is having a vision and we're told that all the idols, which is demons and devils and Satan, cannot speak or hear or walk, which is a clear rabbinic style to say they do not exist. Yeah. Right, thank right, you. Thank people, you for time. Yeah, let, yeah, thanks a lot. It's an honor and a pleasure to have you on as well, Jim Brayshaw. Uh, just let the people know that probably came on later into the show where they could find you, your website, stuff like that. Yeah, please uh, check my website at imaginenosatan.com. Uh, I would love to hear from you at jrbrayshaw at shaw.ca. And uh, you certainly can get in touch with me at uh, Facebook slash jrbrayshaw. Uh, would be where you can find me. But uh, you can catch up on all of that, folks, at imaginenosatan.com. And once again, if any of you listeners 
care to have one of these volumes in an ebook format, just send me an email and I'll email that right out to you. Yeah, once again, it's an uh, honor and a pleasure to have you on the show. And I'm going to let Stanley come in and give his uh, final statement. You can go ahead when you're ready. Yes, um, um, I just want to thank you for inviting me to this discussion. Um, thank you, Jim, for um, having um, for discussing this with me and to engage with me in this very, very important topic. Um, I just want to close off with um, a couple of points. Um, one point is in um, the scripture, Daniel chapter 10. We're going to read from 1 to 6. I think that's very important scripture to focus on because Daniel was having a vision, and this is something that he saw and, and he described in fullness. And it says here, um, verse 1, In the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia, a thing was revealed unto Daniel, whose name was called Belteshazzar, um, and the thing was true. But the time appointed was long, and he understood the thing and had understanding of the vision. In those days, I, Daniel, was mourning three full weeks. I ate no pleasant bread, neither came flesh um, nor wine in my mouth, neither did I anoint myself at all, till three whole weeks were fulfilled. And in the fourth, and 20th day of the first month, as I was by the side of the great river, which is Hideko, um, then I lifted up mine eyes and looked, and behold, a certain man clothed in linen, whose loins were girded with fine gold of Euphaz. Um, his body also was like the burl, his face as the appearance of lightning, and his eyes as lamps of fire and his arms and feet like in the color to polish brass, and the voice of his words like the voice of a multitude. Wow. Um, that's obviously not a human man. It was definitely a spiritual man, and Daniel described him, and he saw this individual. Um, and, you know, you find many cases like this in the Bible where the gods were guarding, and then they see angels, and they fell across because they couldn't handle the brightness of these angels. You know, um, these were not just humans or, you know, um, these were divine individuals um, that were from God. They never claimed to be God. You know, um, so that's the reason why when, um, when um, uh, what's his name, John, John the Baptist's father, I can't think of his name at the moment, Zechariah, had saw Gabriel. The scripture said that um, the, the Gabriel said, don't be in fear, because he saw something he'd never seen before. And that's very important. But I want to address a point that um, Jim made in his, one of his videos, his YouTube videos, it's called Is Satan Real? Um, and part of it says, he said, so my personal feeling is good repays itself and comes back to you so that is a good reason to do good here, whether you believe in a God, a devil, a hell, a heaven, or not. So my response is this. So based upon that understanding, then I don't have to believe that Satan is merely a concept or an understanding of evil because I'll still be fighting evil. I'll be fighting the temptation of sin daily because I believe that Satan is tempting me to commit sin. I can't be wrong about that but the result will be the same. I'll still be fighting sin. However, in Jim's situation, it's a 50-50 wager. What I'm saying is that it's like a Pascal wager. If Jim is correct, then I'll be fighting evil the same way he's fighting evil. The difference is our understanding of the evil, but because I'll be fighting, uh, I'll be fighting the, pr in other words, I'll be fighting the principle of the evil, assuming he's a person, but he'll be fighting the principle and knowing he's the principle of the evil or which a concept or whatever, rather than the being. But the result will be the same because we'll be fighting evil. But if Jim is wrong, meaning that Satan is a real angelic being that has angelic subjects, one would have to admit that Satan would be the one leading this message that's being promoted. That's, that is a far dangerous than my position. It is a huge risk on your part. You know, so um, I, I, I just implore that those that have that mindset to please do the best you can to really consider this wager, that if God does respect um, the ignorant, if you do not know, then he winks at ignorance. Jesus says that they have a cloak for their sin, but you don't because you claim you see. So um, the sin of ignorance is different from the sin, a sin of knowing. So if I don't know, but yet God understands that my heart, that I will fight evil to the battle, no matter what. 
But if you don't know, and yet you are believing that Satan is a cosmic energy, who is making you believe that? A, a, a concept is not going to make me believe differently. So that's why I believe that we have to be careful in this doctrine at all costs. And that's all I like to say. And God bless all. God bless you, Jim. God bless you, Sal. God bless all the listeners. I hope everybody really enjoyed this conversation. Um, I, it was a really a good time having this discussion. Yeah. Thank you, God. God bless you as well, Stanley, and all who listen, and Sal as well. Yeah, I appreciate you guys coming on the show and uh, bringing forth your knowledge. Uh, Stanley, for those people that came into the later part of the show, give them, give them your websites, your social media information as well. Well, I just want to, um, you, can, you can find me as uh, Stanley Sylvain. You can look me up in Facebook um, currently right now. But um, um, I, you can also look me up in Stan Sylvain. I'm, I'm as Stan Sylvain or Stanley Sylvain. Um, I suggest you go for the Stan Sylvain because I'm opening up a new Facebook on that just for the sake of the ministry, of um, Send No More Ministries. Um, I'm going to open up a YouTube video. It's going to come out probably by the, by the beginning of June, like around June 1st, June, the, week, the first week of June. Um, I'm going to be coming out with a new um, ministry called Send No More Ministries, um, which is promoting the, idea, the understanding that you can live in this life. God can give you the power in this life to stop committing sin. It's a very strong topic because a lot of people are saying, hey, you know, because we, we, we're living in sin, we, we're shaking sin, so we, it's impossible for us, to, for us to do this. But God can give you the strength to overcome sin, and, and he can fulfill his power in your life. Mm-hmm. And this is what gonna be a lot of my videos going to be about. So please look for it. It's called Sin No More Ministries, and I'll be promoting it in, in, on Facebook if you request me as either Stan Sylvain, or Stan Lee Sylvain, um, and I will just um, share that with you. Already, um, God bless you all. God bless all the listeners, and happy Sabbath. It's been a good pleasure. All right, I'd like to thank all the people in, uh, that called into the show to listen and also to take notes. Uh, all the people that was in the chat room, you know, we have thousands of listeners and hundreds of people download the show. Once again, without you, the people, there is no debate talk for you. So keep on spreading the word. Keep on telling people about the show, debate talk for you. Uh, blogtalkradio.com slash debate talk for you. And, uh, you know, we'll continue to keep on bringing that great content to you guys. And hopefully you guys take some notes and you guys do your own independent study and your own research so you can get full understanding of uh, all the topics that we have on the show. Once again, I'd like to thank Jim Brayshaw for putting some time in and you know, have his busy schedule to be on the show. <laughs> and also Stanley Sylvain for uh, making some time to be on the show and uh, bringing that knowledge forth to the people out there. And we'll see you guys next time. Take care.